Well, good morning, everybody. Councillors. Councillors, members of the public, welcome to meeting seven of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Uh, guys, 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 you had all summer to talk about that stuff. Councillors, committee members, we're, we're down to business. Although summer is technically not over, here it is. Welcome to members of the committee, other members of the council in attendance if they come, and of course members of the public. For those in the room with us, the screen at the back of the room provides real-time updates concerning where we are in the agenda and what's coming up next. Of course, you can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, or smartphone at toronto.ca backslash council. We acknowledge the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Ashwanabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. It is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit. Are there any uh, declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? None? Confirmation of the minutes from the June 27, 2019 meeting. Move by Councillor McKelvey. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So let's, uh, let's run through the agenda. Item 7.1, amendment to blanket contract to Upper Canada Road Services provision of durable pavement markings. Uh, just um, to bring to your attention, some of these uh, procurement issues are existing contracts in which we're adding money, which always gets attention on why we're renegotiating these for extra money. If you want to hold any of them to, just to find out why we're, we're, we have to uh, top them up, that's fine. 7-1, no, that's not one of the ones, but I'm just saying when we, 7 one actually does add uh, an amount of 350,000. Um, if you want to hold it, that's fine. If you want to move it, it's a small amount. Moved by Councillor Call. All those in favor? Hmm? You want to hold it? Pose those. It, it was a lot of money when I was your age, uh, Councillor Layton. Uh, 7.2 contract award for tender for liquid train upgrades at the High Creek, Highland Creek treatment. Yeah, we 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 did move it and it carried. It's been adopted. Uh, 7.2 contract award for tender call for liquid train upgrades at Highland Creek treatment plant. An amendment to purchase order. Amendment to. Moved by Councillor McKelvey. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item number three, amendment of contract for supply and delivery of sodium hypochlorite for Toronto Water Wastewater Treatment Plants, um, adding an additional $552,000 to the contract. What would you like to do? Moved by Councillor Cole, all those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. Item four, amendment to expired contract subco construction for backhoe services with operators. Once again, an additional amount. Councillor Cole is holding number four. Amendment to uh, blanket contract for hydraulic, this is item 7.5. Amendment to blanket contract, hydraulic flushing, cleaning, and closed circuit television inspection of both service lateral drains and mainline sewers with Pipe Tech, Pipe Tech Infrastructure Services, Inc. Once again, an additional amount added to the existing contract. Councillor McKelvey is moving it. All those in favor? Opposed? carried. Item 7.6, amendment to contract for the installation of new residential water and sewer connections with associated works within Scarborough districts and OJCR Construction Limited. It's an additional amount of 432000 
dollars. Moved by Councillor McKelvey. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item 77, non-competitive contract with lands and forests for consulting for prescribed burn services. 2020-2024. I'll move the staff recommendations. Councillor Layden is moving 7.7. .7. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. So 7.8 is being held for presentation and speakers, so I will hold that. And 7.9, um, it's a report for information, number of tickets issued and charges laid against builders for failures or to protect city trees. Do you want to hold it for discussion yeah. or just move it? I have some questions. Okay, Councillor Layton is holding 7.9. Uh, 710 is held for speakers. And 711, 2020 Canon Ontario Agreement respecting Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health. Uh, maybe if we could just get staff to, when the item comes up, mention some of the top line items. Lou's here anyhow, so he could just give us a very quick. Oh, uh, we'll hold, we'll hold. 711 in Councillor Layton's name. Thank you. Uh, we have a new item. It's been distributed. <laughs> you, <laughs> now that piece might sense. Uh, you have another one? Okay, um, and Councillor Minowong has, has a motion. Has everyone taken a look at it? I'll, I'll read it out. Uh, and there, there's this, the scooter's motion. Um, so Councillor Minowong is, is um, moving a new item onto the agenda that the Infrastructure and Planning Committee, we're the Infrastructure and Environment Committee, requests. Yeah, <laughs> blame staff. Okay, uh, and, and Environment Committee, I'll make that amendment here. Um, request the General Manager Transportation Services to provide an update on the congestion management plan in the next meeting of the committee. I would move to add that to the agenda. I will move that to add that to the agenda. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And I'm taking carriage of a motion um, because it's a rather urgent item because of some timelines with the province uh, to uh, move a motion for discussion here uh, on e-scooter oversight and management it's to meet some deadlines with the province and some looking for some direction from committee. And it builds on an earlier motion that has been adopted by this committee from April 25th, 2019. I believe that was Councillor Layton's uh, motion as well. This is just to introduce. Um, the reason this is coming, um, and I'm just almost moving it on behalf of staff, is a, a September 12th deadline to get feedback from um, municipalities on provincial changes to in the regulatory framework uh, on e-scooters. On e so um, just to add it to the agenda, all those in favor? Opposed? And that is carried. So we're already on uh, item 7.8. I believe staff have a presentation. So we can hear the presentation, then we'll go to deputants, and then we'll go to committee. Thank you very much for your report. Um, normally we, we allocate 10 minutes for presentations. I hope that will suffice.
Good morning, everybody. My name is Jane Welsh. I'm project manager with City Planning. I'm here with my colleague, Kim Stathan. She's acting manager in, in uh, Parks, Forestry, and Recreation. And I'm here also with colleagues from City Planning, PFNR, <coughs> and also the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Oh, you did. <coughs> the forward of the Toronto Biodiversity Strategy, which was written by an Indigenous member of the advisory group, she talks about the fact that Toronto was named for the Mohawk word meaning where there are trees in the water. And that really describes a deep-rooted and meaningful relationship and natural stewardship between the people and this place. Biodiversity loss is an issue that's global-wide and it's, it's unprecedented the amount of biodiversity that we're losing on a daily basis throughout the world. So the biodiversity strategy really aligns itself and supports and is consistent with international policies such as the United Nations and also Canada and Ontario biodiversity strategies. It implements the policies of the Toronto Official Plan and also aligns and supports with supports the resilience strategy, the pollinator protection strategy, and the ravine strategy. And importantly, it aligns with and addresses three issues that cross over both biodiversity and ravines, and that is management of invasive species, ecological integrity, and the planting of native plants. So in Toronto, basically biodiversity refers simply put to the variety of species and among species. In Toronto, we're very fortunate. We have a very um, biodiverse rich region. We're, we're bordered by two major forest zones. We're on the flyway for migratory birds. And surprisingly, almost 14% of, of the city is actually provides habitat. And um, interestingly enough, there was a study that the Conservation Authority and the city did last year and determined that ravines provide $822 million of ecosystem services every year on an annual basis. And ecosystem services, we mean protection from erosion, stormwater management, um, you know, relief from heat, recreation opportunities, and me mental health. So it's quite amazing. So we've been thinking about biodiversity for a long time in the city. We produced a series of biodiversity booklets. We've just reprinted um, the Birds of Toronto copy. And Councillor Layton had suggested some time ago that we, the city should prepare a biodiversity strategy. And we did that, and that draft was before committee a year ago. Since then, we've undertaken substantive um, consultation with the public. We had four public meetings. We constituted an expert advisory group, which consisted of members of, of the Royal Ontario Museum, the Conservation Authority, Toronto Field Naturalists, Protect Nature, uh, the Ontario Invasive Plant Council, FLAP, and representatives from the University of Toronto, York, and Ryerson. So it was quite substantive. We had four um, public open houses. We also had two workshops with the Toronto Ravine Revitalization Study Group. So we had great feedback, and it made a lot of changes in the draft strategy to the product you have before you today. Strong support for the biodiversity strategy. Um, we need to consider ecological integrity. We need more opportunities for citizen stewardship. We need more awareness of biodiversity. And also to promote native species, to do better management of invasive species, and that we have authentic, meaningful engagement with indigenous communities. The biodiversity strategy is a coordinated effort, providing a long-term roadmap that identifies and aligns interdivisional and interagency policies, operations, and actions into one document. The purpose of the biodiversity strategy is to first and foremost protect the health of our existing natural areas, and secondly, to restore the, and enhance the quality and quantity of habitat across the city within and beyond natural areas. It aims to increase public awareness of the enormous value of nature and biodiversity in the city. And finally, it acknowledges the work that has been going on for decades uh, related to protecting and enhancing our natural areas and identifies new opportunities and the gaps uh, that we need to fill to improve our coordinated efforts. We recognize that there are significant threats to Toronto's biodiversity. These include habitat loss through growth and development, invasive species that compromise the growth of native species, climate change, which is causing extreme weather events and longer growing seasons, which may displace native species and allow non-native species to become more prolific, and stresses from act, uh, human activities, which of course happen on public as well as on private land. 
The city and partners like the uh, Toronto and Region Conservation Authority have been leading work to improve conditions for biodiversity for decades. Toronto's official plan leads all work through strong parks and open space and natural heritage policies, which allow city bylaws to regulate activities related to trees, ravines, natural features, and green roofs. Toronto's Urban Forestry Branch engages the community in Toronto's parks, ravines, and natural areas, and in 2018 alone, hosted over 260 events, engaging over 3,700 volunteers, who planted close to 20,000 native trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. The City of Toronto actively manages invasive plant species in 72 sites across ravines and natural areas, and in an additional 46 of Toronto's environmentally significant areas. A request for proposals to develop a framework for best management practices for all of Toronto's ESAs is anticipated to be awarded early next year. Finally, Toronto supports biodiversity across the built form in the public realm through initiatives such as the Toronto Green Standard and Toronto's Green Streets. I just want to take a minute to note that uh, through the TRCA's watershed report card system, in the past, Toronto has received a collective grade of D. I just wanted to highlight that this is an estimated average of all the watersheds and applies to four major themes of groundwater quality, surface water quality, forest conditions and land cover. And, but to be clear, this is not a measurement of biodiversity. The biodiversity strategy is recommending that the city, TRCA and partners develop an ecological integrity monitoring framework as there is an opportunity to better monitor and evaluate Toronto's biodiversity, which can complement the citizen science monitoring and reporting efforts which we currently support with in, uh, environmental and academic institutions like the Faculty of Forestry at the University of Toronto. So the biodiversity strategy consists of a vision, 10 principles and 23 actions. The principles include that biodiversity is fundamental to health, it's key to resilience, we need to use ecological integrity to assess that health and to guide the management and we need to measure and report on results. The 23 actions include developing an ecological integrity monitoring framework, reviewing policies and bylaws for more opportunities to support biodiversity, to identify priority sites for restoration, to advance plans and programs for the management of invasives, to expand the urban biodiversity booklet series, and to develop a guide on backyard biodiversity. Most of the 23 actions can be accommodated within our existing work plans. The point of this document is really that it's an umbrella document, it's a coordinated um, across city divisions and between agency partners so that all pieces around biodiversity are in one place. And of course many of the actions tie directly with the ravine strategy implementation. The report has four recommendations, one is adopting the strategy, two is to develop an ecological integrity monitoring and reporting framework through the Ecosystem Services Working Group, and this group had been established with the adoption of the Ravine Strategy by Council. Three, to continue to work on implementing the management of invasives, and to undertake a review of gaps and opportunities to improve that, again, through the Ecosystem Services Working Group. And then finally, four, to adopt a resolution for the City of Toronto to join the Biophilic Cities Network. Well, thank you, and that concludes our presentation. Great, thank you very much. Uh, now what we can do is move right to deputations and then ask questions of staff later or uh, if you have specific questions related to the presentation, we can ask them now. We'll do deputations. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation and your report and we'll come to questions for staff a little later. Laura Curran. Hi, so we're Laura Kern and Lauren South, we're presenting together. Okay, great, thank you very much.
you try that too, if you like. Yeah, maybe try that. I'm, I'm waiting for the presentation. I'm Sorry, we're just having a technical difficulty. There we go. There we go. We have lots of others, but we will listen to this one. All right. They're ready to go. All set. Okay, we're ready now. Okay, Sorry. great. Thank you very much. All right, um, I'm Laura Curran, and this is Lauren South, and we're both University of Toronto students uh, studying forestry in our undergrads. So the, we're here today to talk to you guys about Japanese knotweed in Toronto's ravines, which highly affect biodiversity in the city as a whole. So Laura and I here, are here today speaking with you about Japanese knotweed because we spent all summer studying it in uh, Moore Park Ravine and Park Drive Reservation lands. Japanese knotweed is an invasive herbaceous species that is regulated by the Ontario Invasive Species Act where it's designated as restricted. It can grow up to three meters tall, meters tall in one growing season and it spreads very easily which makes it a big problem. The area that we studied was composed of two ESAs, or environmentally significant areas. Of the 86 ESAs created by City Council, many are found within ravine land. ESAs are considered priority areas for management according to the Toronto Ravine Strategy. From our experience this summer, we do not think that current management is sufficient, particularly when it comes to Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed devastates both infrastructure and native ecology. Although it is a large problem in the ravines, Japanese knotweed is also prevalent in city alleyways and even in people's yards. Japanese knotweed causes structural damage to building foundations and to other great infrastructure. This is because it can grow through up to eight centimeters thick of concrete. In the UK, it has even become such a problem that it decreases home values and makes it difficult to obtain mortgages when knotweed is present. Japanese knotweed also poses a risk for local ecology. This summer, we have seen evidence of it destabilizing stream banks. It reduces native biodiversity, shades out other species effectively creating monocultures, and increases the risk of erosion as compared to native vegetation. So now that you understand how big of a problem Japanese knotweed can pose, these are the results from our study this summer. So the total amount of Japanese knotweed that we mapped in these two ravines was 4,173.5 meters squared, which is equivalent to about three and a half Olympic sized pools. This is the map that we produced here, which shows Japanese knotweed on public and private land. Um, public land is in blue and private land is in red um, in Moore Park and Park Drive Reservation lands. So we map Japanese knotweed in these areas to get a detailed view of the Japanese knotweed problem so that we can find a better way to manage it. You can see that 62% of Japanese knotweed mapped is on city land, which makes this a city problem as well as a ravine resident problem. This is just a snapshot of two ravines in Toronto, but we can infer that this is an issue in Toronto's whole ravine system and the city of Toronto as a whole. In your biodiversity strategy that was presented today, they outline a need for an invasive species management plan. We believe this plan should at minimum prioritize the four provincially regulated terrestrial invasive species, which includes, includes Japanese knotweed, and Japanese knotweed invasions should be prioritized in Toronto's ravines before the problem becomes unmanageable. Some, uh, in your recently released biodiversity strategy, we also noticed that you listed some of the most invasive species in Toronto. We think Japanese knotweed should be included in this list because it is also one of the most invasive species in Toronto and is provincially regulated. This is one of the ravines that we studied this summer. It's Moore Park Ravine. We need to look to the, fu uh, look to the future of our ravines and decide how we want them to look. Do we want invasive monocultures of Japanese knotweed? 
eroding slopes, and infrastructure damage, if we do not improve invasive species management in our city, this degradation will only increase. In order to see improvements, we must all work together to protect our city's biodiversity. Let's do better, Toronto. Thank you. If you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Layton and then Councillor McKelvey. Thank you very much. Could you put the slide up of the recommended change? I, I ran out of time copying it down and I want to write a motion for, for us to do that. And Councillor McKelvey can, um, can ask a question that might give me enough time, but thank you very much for, is, uh, for your work. Is it this, this one? Perfect, yeah. okay. thank you. My turn. You have what you need? Yeah. Councillor Layton. Yeah, I have, thank you. Great, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I want to thank you for coming in, and I am supposed to ask things as questions. So would you be able to go back to the Department of Forestry and tell other students about your experience here at City Hall and encourage them to also give deputations on important uh, issues that... For sure, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then my second question is, uh, I am not familiar with, with Japanese knotweed. I don't know if it's... I live in Scarborough, if it's just not as pervasive out there, whereas many of the others that you've spoken about so given that this seems pretty unique and persistent, like what is the what is the way to control this? Like is it just brute force you have to go and, and dig it out or um, you know we, we don't like herbicides, so how do, how do we deal with this? Okay, so this document here that's on the screen, the, the best management practices in Ontario has a bunch of guidelines on that. Um, so there's uh, three main um, eradication methods. There's um, digging, so you have to get to a certain depth that's outlined in the best practices document. Um, it's several meters deep, I believe. Um, tarping as well. So if you put a tarp over um, the species and block out the sunlight, that can get rid of it. Um, but it also depends on the size of the patch of the species and um, whether or not it's a satellite patch or a, or a central large patch. Um, and that's all outlined in this document. Um, and we used this document to organize our study as well, so there's good information in there. Um, and also, it's it's still being discovered, so the best management practices are guidelines for now, but there needs to be more study to, to ensure that these practices are actually the best method. So it's a problem that is going to need continued research. And then uh, for, uh, for this, um, what is it like, what ultimately are, is it, are its impacts? You mentioned the infrastructure, one, infrastructure ones, but like, who is it out competing, or what, what, what function is it replacing in these ravines that we are missing out on by having it there? Um, well, because it, it creates these monocultures of just its own species, basically underneath you just, um, you just have bare soil with a few, like several different stalks of just this one species, and it doesn't actually hold um, the soil very well, even though it has a vast root system. So it can lead to more erosion in the ravines. So if you could replace this knotweed with native species that actually hold soil better and have other benefits such as habitat and, I mean, we all know biodiversity is a really good thing, so monocultures are generally very bad. <laughs> Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor McKelvey. Any other questions, Councillor uh, Menawang? Japanese knotweed, this is the thing they, that um, if you try and um, remove it from your soil or your garden, it just breaks off and then there are little n nubs at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. and you said you can dig da down and the, the ways that you could dig down and take it out, but you have to go down really deep, right? Yeah. And yeah, the root system is very, very deep. It's yeah, and it's all over my garden. Oh. <laughs> It's impossible. No, it's it's it's, it's turning right. Japanese. It's, it's not a gardening show. No, I no, no. I I just want to ask you because I mean, if you want to do something about this, is I, I mean, I'm just it's like this is a fairly inv invasive. And this is the guy you got in your garden. So you said you could put a tarp over it. Yeah. And what are the two other things? So uh, digging. So behind you, I put up a slide where we have. Um, it's kind of pale there, but on the on the of those three images on the right, 
Um, that's what the Japanese knotweed rooting system looks like. So you can see that there isn't very many roots near the surface. It's a lot deeper down. So digging is a good um, way to eradicate it, but once you have the roots, as soon as, like if you put them in the compost, for example. They'll grow again. Yeah. So my question, so what, what's your solution? So you said herbicides work too, yes? Herbicides do work, yes. Okay, so are you um, It's just not always the best option. No, I, so yeah. you want to, you say this, you want to do something about this, but it seems like the herbicides are the most, you can't put a tarp over the, over all of Moore Park, for example. Mm -hmm. That's not going to work, right? Well, they won't like it, but yeah, you, can't dig, you can't dig down deep enough to pull everything out, and you just need a little bit of, so are, are herbicides is option number three? You said there were four, what's the fourth one? I think I said three. Maybe just three? Yeah, I three. think I said three. Sorry. So, because this knotweed is taking over, so would you advocate for the use of herbicides to clear this up? I think I'd advocate first for more study to figure out what the most effective way, but also for um, a combination of different of different removal methods. So if you have, a, another method is also actually biological control, which they're studying right now. Which so means that, what? Um, that means releasing these bugs called psyllids, and they just eat Japanese knotweed. Oh. So it's, the, it's a good potential, but they're still also in the process of figuring out how best to, um, like, or how, how effective they are. So it's good sometimes you can also cut the root, or the, the stems, and it doesn't affect the root system. So in, if you do that in combination with other um, management methods, that can also help. The knotweed's going to take over the entire city, isn't it? <laughs> Essentially, That's what yeah. we're afraid of. <laughs> no, no, it will. If we don't make yeah, some thanks. changes. Yeah. We apologize. Uh, Councillor Perusa and then Councillor Cole. I guess it likes water. It likes to grow in riparian areas, as uh, that's along stream banks, as well as in open areas and in shade. It likes to grow everywhere, essentially. So we found it in the ravine near the water. We've also found it near the top on people's private property and along the slopes. So it seems to just be able to grow everywhere, which is a big problem. I, I guess that because it's called Japanese, it come, came from Japan, right? Yes. Okay, so is, is all of Japan knotweed? No, so um, an invasive species can be non-invasive in its native um, country. So in Japan, for example, where there's other species that are good at competing with Japanese knotweed, it, it wouldn't be an invasive problem. But when it comes to Canada and there's no competing species that are naturally adapted to compete with it, it doesn't have any competitors and so it can take over. C competitors in what sense? like other plants that can grow in those um, open areas better than it can, if that makes sense. Yeah, generally the nature of an invasive species is it's invasive in its non-native habitat. So that's why Japanese knotweed is such a problem here and in the UK where it's very established and doesn't have those natural competitors that may be um, other plants or they could be maybe those psyllids that are the like insects that are in the native, hab native habitat as well. Does that answer your question? Well, in part. So, so in, for example, in Japan, um, they have um, they don't have soil erosion. I mean, you got they have knotweed, so they have erosion, right? So, th would they have more erosion than we do? I'm I'm not sure to be honest, but I don't think it's as um, it may just not create these big monocultures as much in Japan. I'm I'm just honestly not sure. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peruza. I think Councillor Cole. Yeah. Um, that most people don't even know what a Japanese knotweed looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say so. Like it, it also for everyone here. We <laughs> showed some pictures, and it also looks kind of like bamboo. Um, well, it looks kind of like bamboo when it's died off. Um, so yeah, it would really help if people know what it looks like because I've seen it in people's gardens and they, th they think it looks very pretty yeah. so they don't know that it's invasive and actually can be spreading. So. 
So. Yeah, it's just like the Norwegian maples. Uh, people are still buying and planting Norwegian maples. Councilor Perutz has Norwegian maples in his backyard. He doesn't even know that they're an invasive species. So how, how can we really deal with it if nobody recognizes them or knows uh, that these are dangerous invasive species? I think that highlights a big issue that we need more awareness of invasive species. So you would think it'd be helpful for us to support a motion which asks for the City of Toronto to undertake a robust campaign of making the citizens of Toronto aware of these major invasive species, you know, through our uh, blue box calendars, all these things, so we have pictures of these species so that we know they're not good to have in your backyard, Councillor Peruzza. So that's what uh, I'm going to be moving. Okay. Oh, thank you. That sounds good. Are you sure? I'm, I'm going to check. I'm I, <laughs> no, um, it's, it's not a gardening call-in show, but thank you for all your observations. Any other, que any other questions for the deputants? Bring the proof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ellen uh, Schwartzell, Toronto Field Naturalist. Thank you for coming, you have five minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And yes, I'm representing the Toronto Field Naturalist this morning. Uh, we've got a long record of, of experience and expertise with Toronto's ravines. We've been essentially the eyes on Toronto's ravines for close to 100 years. Um, and this September, we, we want to both applaud and urge action on the city's new strategies for biodiversity and for the ravines. And those two strategies, of course, are, are interlinked, but they urgently need to get rolling. Uh, Toronto is lucky in many ways. We have uh, still a lot of natural heritage. The city's experts have said about 4% of the city's area is, is still environmentally significant. So that's, that's really important. But those areas face intense and growing pressures. We know that development, pollution, erosion, severe weather, high visitor numbers, and of course invasive species all are putting pressure uh, on, on those ravines. And, and the degraded habitat and, and the problems have been, they've been um, enumerated in multiple studies. The TRCA has done studies, and now, of course, the whole world has been told by the McLean's ar Magazine article that came out in, in the end of August. So the biodiversity strategy is a foundation document, no more, no less. And our members hope and request that over the next one to five years, that strategy is going to host, a, 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 is going to trigger a host of measures on the ground. Ultimately, the, the people in Toronto want to see our city's most vulnerable natural habitats, the gems in High Park, the Don Valley, the Humber Valley along the lakeshore. They want to see those prioritized, monitored, and restored. We know the biodiversity strategy has had a long gestation. The city's planners had a biodiversity roundtable in, in 2017. There was a lot of public consultation. So this strategy has been in the works for over two and a half years. So please, let's get the strategy finalized, let's start the action, and let's get the results happening. And, and the action steps that we emphasize are needed. We need funding and an action plan to support stewardship. You know that dedicated volunteer groups such as the Toronto Field Naturalists and, and many others have already spent years weeding and, and planting and mulching in our parks and ravines often with city coordination, but the work needs stronger city coordination to triage the top priorities, to scale up projects, and above all, when you've newly restored a natural area, you need to keep it healthy in the long term. So budget and staffing have got to be strengthened for the city's Natural Environment Community Programs Department, and most particularly for the Community Stewardship Program. We also need, as we've just heard, a stronger focus on fighting invasives, because frankly, the aggressiveness of invasive weeds means our natural areas are being eaten alive. We aren't by any stretch keeping pace with the, the, with, with the degradation. And third, we need to see priority protection for the best bits of nature. They're not all the same. The city has got to identify which, identi which environmentally significant areas most urgently need management plans and give teeth to those management plans. Nice vision statements on paper aren't going to cut it. 
We were pleased to hear earlier this year that the city's urban forestry staff have been working to identify the most sensitive zones within the environmentally significant areas. Those evaluations have to be fast-tracked, and we would like progress to be shared publicly. For example, a city-led workshop on the status of environmentally significant areas and their management plans would bring the community up to speed and would be a great project to do for the winter months. To manage something effectively, you also need to monitor. So we were delighted to learn that, this city, that the city this year has established about 200 e ecological monitoring sites in ravines and natural areas in partnership, partnership with the U of T. And we understand that the city is following the lead of several other Southern Ontario municipalities by using a tool called Vegetation Sampling Protocol. Again, our communities would love to learn more about that initiative ideally through a public meeting or a workshop to bring us all up into the loop and, and exchange expertise. So the city does not need to go it alone on this. You can lean on your communities of volunteers. And for ourselves, we know that we can contribute experience and with, with restoration projects. The sites like the Glen Stewart Ravine, uh, where the city that did complete that in 2012, Cottonwood Flats, where we continue to lead a, a, a multi-year monitoring project, and Todd Morden Mills Wildlife Preserve have taught us a lot about setting priorities, perseverance, and building capacities. So we have dedicated volunteers ready to be deployed, and we have active and well-connected members who are working to spread the word. So thanks for this, this, offer, this opportunity to offer our input, and we hope that November 7, we can be present to applaud the rollout of the Ravine Strategy Implementation Plan. So thanks for your time, and I'm happy to take some questions. Great, thank you very much. Any questions for the deputant? Okay, thank you very much. Very good, thanks. Joan York, the Deer Park Residence Group. Great, thank you very much for coming. You have five minutes. Just, just let me check the mic. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Councillor James Pasternak and members of the Infrastructure and Environment Committee. My name is Joan York and I'm a board member of the Deer Park Residence Group. Over many years, our family and friends walked and cross-country skied in many of Toronto's ravines. On moving in 2013, I became aware of the sad state of the surrounding ravines, where I met a group of people who shared my concern and had been involved in documenting and photographing this for many years. Looking over past correspondence, we have been here many times before, my involvement started in 2015. In 2016, the presidents of the five residence groups abutting the Midtown Ravines wrote to Mayor John Tory, drawing his attention to the state of the ravines and the urgent need to take action. We made deputations to the Parks and Environment Committee in 2016. We had several meetings with our local councillors, a walk through the ravine with city staff and Councillor Wong Tam. On September the 25th, 2017, the presidents of the five residence groups again wrote letters to the executive committee. And in September 2016, made deputations to the executive committee. On October the 2nd, 2017, the city council about the ravine strategy. And on November the 17th, deputations to the parks and environment committee. Now on September the 9th, we are here again deputing on behalf of the health and biodiversity of our ravines in support of the biodiversity strategy to be considered at City Council on October the 2nd. You must be drowning in paper with all this stuff. Um, the biodiversity re report is an important document recognizing its importance to a healthy city. It highlights the challenges to protect habitat that supports biodiversity from further loss, to restore and enhance degraded natural areas, including water and soils that are the foundation of healthy ecosystems, and to raise awareness about diversity and why it's important. These are also the aims of the Midtown Ravine Group. 
A master plan for these ravines was approved by City Council in 2017. We recognize this as a long-term project and a coordinated effort will be beneficial. However, as a designated environmentally sensitive area, many parts of the ravine continue to deteriorate and we would urge the city to take a more aggressive approach to eradicating invasive species, e.g. that Japanese knotweed and dog strangling vine. The residents' associations are working hard to raise awareness through newsletters, letters to residents about the ravines and invasive species. By providing an opportunity to engage young people, we initiated a pilot project called Seeds to Seedlings, a project with four schools, funded in part by the Faculty of Forestry and the U of T, five residents' associations, the Peacock Foundation and private donors. The schools are now embarking on two, a two-year or three-year project in which seeds from old growth trees are planted in seed box nurtured to be transplanted into gardens, parks, and ravines when ready. This program has been enthusiastically received by both students and staff who are incorporating the science, stewardship, and advocacy into their curricula. The program has expanded with four more schools participating, and approaches are being made to expand further. The young people are the environmentalists of the future. I believe that the biodiversity strategy is also a good fit with the principles of the ravine strategy to protect, invest, connect, partner and celebrate. I'd just like to add one more thing to my submission here and that is to say until I moved and joined the local ravine group and had walked in the ravines for many years like the, the cancer, I was totally unaware of Japanese knotweed. That's how I've been on a steep learning curve, I can assure you. Respectfully submitted you could, if you could, If you could wrap up, that'd be great. Pardon? You're at your time limit. If you could wrap up, that would be great. I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Questions for the deputant? Yeah, Councillor Cole. Since my children were young, young, nearly 60 years. So for 60 years, and it wasn't until recently that you were made aware of, because of your work, volunteer work, Absolutely. with the ravine protection. Absolutely. Uh, By many people, I think I, I recognize this as something huge and growing, but I didn't know what it was. Yeah, so I guess you're probably typical of so many people in Toronto Absolutely. that they Absolutely. walk by these uh, dangerous invasive species every day and they can't identify them because they've never had that awareness. Right. From our apartment, we look over the ravine, and most people say, doesn't it look wonderful? Doesn't it look green? Doesn't it look great? And it's only when you get down there that you really realize. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cole. Any other questions for the deputant? No? OK, thank you very much. Uh, Julia Michalski? Great, thank you for coming, you have five minutes. Hi, my name is Julie Mikulski. I am an environmental science student at the University of Guelph, and I'm here to talk to you about the Norway maples in our Toronto ravines. The Norway maple, an extremely damaging invasive tree species, is spreading rapidly across our Toronto ravines. If it is not effectively managed, it will make it impossible for our other native species to survive, and could turn our ravines into what is known as a green desert, land with little to no biodiversity, composed of only the same invasive species. So how did we get here? Native to Europe and Asia, the Norway maple was introduced to Canada in the 1700s as an ornamental plant, but since then it has spread rapidly. In 1977, non-native tree cover was just 
By 2016, this number had jumped to 40%. And if no action is taken, this number is predicted to jump to 60% within the next two decades. Here's what makes the Norway maple so destructive. It produces a large crop of seeds that can spread rapidly across our ravines and can germinate in almost all soil types. It has an extensive shallow root system that outcompetes native plants for water and nutrients and contributes to soil erosion. And they produce a dense canopy cover that blocks light from ground level, making it impossible for most of our native species to grow under or near Norway maples. The result is an aggressive invader that creates an environment that only supports more life of other Norway maples. So how can we fix this? We must treat the Norway maple as a top priority in order to prevent ongoing deterioration. And to this end, a few key steps should be taken. Proposed solution number one, develop a management strategy that focuses directly on the Norway maple. All of our current strategies do address invasive species and they emphasize the importance of proper management. However, none of them have a management strategy specifically for the Norway maple. This current Toronto biodiversity strategy presented today does have a small blurb on Norway maple. However, it ends here. Ideally, in our upcoming ravine implementation plan, we can have a separate section dedicated to just Norway maple management. It is not enough to have general action plans towards all invasive species because there are different levels of priority and the Norway maple is one species of top priority that requires its own action plan immediately. Proposed solution number two. Allow small Norway maples on ravine land to be easily and legally removed without a permit. And here's why. The Toronto Biodiversity Strategy states that the techniques to manage invasive species are resource intensive. But here's where I disagree. There is a huge resource right under our noses that we're not taking advantage of, and those are Toronto citizens that are eager to help. There are 30,000 private addresses on ravine land, which poses a huge opportunity to get our homeowners involved at no cost, not to mention all of the other Toronto citizens that are constantly using our ravines on public property. However, the trees on ravine land are protected under Municipal Code Chapter 658-2A, which states that to remove a tree of any size on ravine land is illegal unless you have a permit. The problem is the process to apply for and obtain a permit is costly, it's complicated, it's time consuming, and it's discouraging. You can see here that just to apply to remove one tree requires extensive paperwork and costs a minimum of $117. These are all barriers that discourage environmental stewardship from our Toronto citizens. However, if we could revise this bylaw, we would actually encourage community involvement. For example, let's say I'm a private homeowner or a high school student that's looking to get more community hours. I would be able to go into the ravines, identify a small Norway maple, and remove it easily and quickly without any consequences. That way we get them at a small size before they do too much harm. So the take home messages are that we need to make the Norway maple a priority by developing its own management strategy in our upcoming ravine implementation plan that actually encourages environmental stewardship by our Toronto citizens. And in order to do this, we can revise chapter 658-2A of the municipal code and allow small Norway maples to be easily and legally removed on ravine land without a permit. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, questions for the deputant, Councillor McKelvey, then Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you for coming in and, and giving this presentation today. Um, similar to the questions I asked earlier, what, what specifically are they out competing or what ecological function is being hampered by having them present in our ravine systems? So they have lots of damaging impacts. Um, some of them are highlighted on this slide. But one of their main problems is that they create an environment much like Japanese knotweed that's all monoculture. So we're starting to see more and more Norway maples taking over and it's not allowing our native species to grow near or under them. So if you see a place with lots of Norway maple, sometimes you'll find that around the base of the tree, there are no other species that are able to grow. It's bare soil. And much like Japanese knotweed with their extensive root system, 
it can contribute to soil erosion and just create an unhealthy ravine system overall. And do we have or do you have um, any information about like how pervasive they are? Like what numbers are we looking at in the city right now? Or is that data still being gathered? Um, from the Toronto Ravine study, here we see um, just these stats. This was the non-native tree cover uh, throughout the years, and so they're predicting that in the years to come, we're going to have 60% non-native tree cover. Um, so it, they are spreading rapidly, and they're becoming an increasing problem. And the city has a, an ambitious plan, I think, and staff can correct me later if I'm wrong, I think it's 40% canopy cover by 2040. Um, what do you think we should be planting instead? What has the most likelihood of outcompeting Norway maple and holding its ground? Um, we have lots of beneficial native species here in Toronto. I am no forest expert. However, I know that our native sugar maple tree um, does great in our ravines. We're hoping to have more of that. Um, people can sometimes confuse it for the Norway maple, which is part of the problem we were talking about. They look into the ravines and they think that we have a lush, beautiful ravines when really they're all Norway maples. So sugar maple is one example of a native species here that is quite beneficial to our ravines. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cole. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, do you know whether you can still purchase uh, Norway uh, maple seedlings at uh, garden stores in Toronto? I believe you cannot. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but last I knew, uh, there's a ban on selling and planting Norway maples. I think one of the main problems is that because of their seeds that can spread so rapidly, um, even if they're not being purchased and planted, the wind is bringing seeds all across the city and they're germinating in the soil and they're growing everywhere, whether people realize it or not. So I guess the real conundrum, and you're sort of uh, making us uh, aware of it, is that on the other hand, we've got these goals of uh, canopy cover uh, that we have to meet. On the other hand, uh, we've got a lot of our canopy cover now being uh, provided by the Norway maples. So uh, what do we do uh, to try and manage this uh, very, very challenging uh, you know, issue? Yeah, that's exactly right, and we have this goal of canopy cover, however, um, it would be in our best interest to make sure that that canopy are the right species that are beneficial to our ravines. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Cole. Councillor Perusa. You, you mentioned that um, you have to get a permit to, to remove one of these trees. Why do you think that's so? Um, I think that there's been concern in the past of wanting to make sure our citizens do the right thing and that they are removing the right tree. So perhaps a permit process was used to ensure that the people are taking the time to make sure that they're pulling the right species. Um, however, because it's extremely complicated, most people either can't afford to apply for one or they're just discouraged altogether. Um, there are actually, my PowerPoint's gone now, but there are tons of online resources that are available to help you identify species online. Um, and so I think without a permit process, it's actually quite easy for our citizens to be able to identify them properly and do the right thing without having a permit process. Well, so if you, you've thought about it, so how do you, how do you make sure that uh, if, you, if you allowed a non-permit um, type system to remove, uh, I don't even know if that's possible, but to remove one of these trees, how would you ensure that a sugar maple isn't cut down instead of a, um, a Norway uh, maple? Well, I think, I think it's also mentioned in our most recent Toronto Biodiversity Strategy. Um, the city prides itself on all of our monitoring systems that we have out there. So um, there are environmental stewards that are going out, monitoring our ravines, um, ensuring that the right species are there. And um, if we didn't have a permit process, it poses huge opportunity to actually get this involved in 
so many different areas. So, for example, um, if this was allowed, we could have school groups that are going out to remove Norway maples that could be accompanied by um, a very experienced forest ecologist or an environmental steward who could be there to monitor the students doing the right thing, for example. Um, and then there could also be continuous monitoring from the city going through our ravines and making sure that. So, so your, your suggestion is instead of a formal application, just kind of like informal oversight yeah. with informal approval. Yes, and I would also make the argument that um, the people that are eager to go out and practice environmental stewardship and who want to go into our ravines for the purpose of pulling the invasive Norway maple will take the time and effort to make sure that they are pulling the right species. Um, so I think people will be able to do the right thing. Thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor Peruza. Uh, Councillor Menawong. Yeah, in the ravines right now, I, I, was, I actually was recounting a story, one of our um, staff members here, we planted 20 years ago some, I think, butternut trees. And then about 10 years later, when there was a path going down, they were paving a path down the Charles Sorrell ravine, um, the TRCA chopped down all the trees and used it as a staging area for their heavy equipment. And then so I asked, well, how is it that they can um, chop down all these trees? And I was told that the TRCA d is not required to get um, permits to tear down trees in the ravine. Is that, are you familiar with the bylaws? Are you? I'm not sure what the, the TRCA is allowed. On a regional conservation authority. I, I'm not sure what they're allowed to, to do with a permit or not or the city, but um, what we know is that Toronto citizens on pi private or public land for ravine property aren't allowed to remove anything unless they have a permit. So my second question is, as you say, just on, on the ravine lands, w why not allow people just, if Norway's are I invasive and a, you know, not, um, not a tree that we like, why wouldn't you just sort of writ large allow people to take down Norway maples um, if we don't like those trees. Yeah, that, that's the goal, that's the ultimate goal. Just because of the uh, time constraints of this presentation, I was just highlighting the ravine land, um, which is protected as an ecologically significant area. But ideally across the whole city, we could have Norway maples allowed to be pulled without a permit um, so that it's easy for everybody everywhere. Okay, thanks. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Uh, just very quickly, on page 30, there is a reference to the Norway maple story and talks about many of the themes uh, that, um, that you've highlighted. In the action plan, uh, there's uh, action uh, number two, which is develop action plans for regional species of concern, and action item eight, uh, review policies and bylaws for opportunities to support biodiversity. Do you think those two action plans and staff will have to report back to committee cover what you're recommending recommending um yes i think we further though for the upcoming ravine implementation plan which i believe is coming out in november um, if we could have a norway maple strategy in that document because that will make action happen quicker um, it's a great starting point what we have in the Toronto biodiversity strategy. Um, however, we want to stray away from making it too general and we need a specific Norway maple plan. Okay, thank you very much. Paul Shrivener, Toronto Ravine Revitalization Study. Thanks for coming, Paul, you have five minutes. Good morning, councillors. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Terry Lang, who is the uh, coordinator for the uh, Toronto R Ravines Revitalization Study. And I should just tell you uh, before I start uh, the body of my presentation that uh, uh, back in 1977, and there was a slide up uh, from the previous presenter, Dale Taylor and I commissioned a study of Rosedale Ravines to do exactly what we're talking about today, to inventory on uh, plots 
um, what the uh, forest cover is, the health of the forest, and so on. And we did this in cooperation uh, with the help of U of T. And then we found that 10% uh, of the forest cover uh, was invasive species. Um, Forty years later, we decided that the study needed to be refreshed. Uh, so <clears throat> we commissioned uh, U of T Forestry, which is a very good partner. Uh, and we did the exact same plots, three ravines, and we found that the uh, invasive species cover was a 40%. So um, as we talk now, uh, the invasives are marching along. The uh, Norway maple uh, trees are full of seeds, which will be released in another week or so. And uh, that's the new generation, another generation of trees. The Toronto Ravine Revitalization Study uh, employs students every year. Uh, we, and we've been doing this since uh, 2015. We want to support students, they do good field work, and uh, we refreshed our study, uh, published it in 2018. I think many of you have seen this. Uh, the report before you, the staff report before you, was excellent and staff are be, to be commended for its production. And I would say to you councillors that, uh, believe it or not, in talking about this biodiversity strategy, and then in November, uh, about the ravine strategy, you are making history. Um, 15, 20 years ago, no one would have thought of talking about this. And you have the opportunity here to really change the history of Toronto's ravines and to save them uh, from uh, turning into ecological deserts with a very few species and all the issues that go with that. You have a letter that we uh, sent to you, uh, before you, and uh, in that letter we ask that um, recommendation two be tweaked, so it would read uh, and include uh, ecological integrity monitoring, reporting, and implementation and budgetary framework for Toronto's natural areas, ravines, and that it report back uh, this time next year, this working group. And the reason for that is that uh, these ravines, um, if they were on fire, our approach would be quite different. We would talk briefly and we would get on with it and we would save them. Well, the ravines are on fire, but it's a different kind of fire. And every year, as I said, the Japanese knotweed, the dog strangling vine and so on, they advance their range, they advance their grip. And so if we talk about this for another three or four years, uh, the situation will just be worse and worse and harder and harder to deal with. And also we want to start seeing a, some budgetary um, rigor put into this. What's it going to cost to do the job? Uh, and I think that everybody who's been deputing today has basically been giving you the same message. And so uh, the other thing is that we find that uh, the uh, uh, recommendations and so on in the discussion, you have the biodiversity strategy on one hand, you have the ravine strategy on the other hand, and there's quite a bit of overlap there. And we would encourage uh, you and staff to uh, figure out ways to try and um, uh, simplify that and make it a little less confusing. Um, and the other thing is uh, Japanese knotweed. There was a, uh, 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 some discussion about that earlier. And I just wanted to say that uh, it's my understanding that uh, there's an English study uh, is called the Swansea Report, which looked at uh, studied Japanese knotweed for five years and the ways to eradicate it. And it recommended a multi-pronged approach, digging, cutting, um, and use of herbicides. And thank you very much for your attention. And we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Paul. Questions for the deputant? No? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Terry Hong, Toronto. No, we're, we're together here. Oh, you're sorry. You're right, you're together. Uh, Karen Uchik. Uh, 
thank you for coming. You have five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the biodiversity strategy for Toronto. <clears throat> We're commenting on behalf of Protect Nature TO, a coalition of over 20 nature and stewardship-based organizations advocating for the protection of wildlife and natural areas <clears throat> excuse me, across the City of Toronto. Uh, Leslie and I are both members of this group and we are also co-chairs of the High Park Natural Environment Committee where we have gained practical experience with many of the topics addressed by this strategy. <clears throat> and also a lot to do with invasive species and restoration. Um, there is much to applaud in the Toronto Biodiversity Strategy. <clears throat> this document is the result of extensive consultation and many ele elements reflect the feedback that was received, which is a tribute to the collaboration among staff, expert advisors and the public. This strategy recognizes our city's strengths and opportunities, as well as the challenges that threaten our natural places and the life they support. It underscores the intrinsic value of nature, as well as the many ways in which we benefit from biodiversity. The strategy provides a vision of how much more can be done and needs to be done to protect, restore, and enhance biodiversity in our city. It translates global concerns such as climate change into practical local actions. One of the many important findings of the consultation process is the gaping divide between those who are tuned into the natural world and those who have minimal contact with nature or are aware of it only as a backdrop. And I would say that the discussion earlier about Japanese uh, knotweed shows some of this divide that uh, where education is needed. For Toronto's biodiversity to be protected and appreciated in the long term, this divide will need to be bridged through concerted effort, raising awareness within the city's own staff and related agencies, including awareness of existing legal protections and regulations is a key step. Fostering more public programs, including participation in stewardship and in guided nature walks, will also help broaden the appreciation of biodiversity in the city. Educating staff and decision makers, engaging with the public, removing invasive species, these and many other important steps are included in the proposed action plan. Specific departments are identified as being responsible for a lead role in implementing these actions, while others are identified as partners. <clears throat> this is a sound approach a great deal can be accomplished through cooperative efforts. But ultimately, these actions will only be effective if they are properly resourced, both with staff and with funding. Another essential component is accountability for results. This infrastructure committee here can play a key role in requiring regular updates for each of the proposed actions. We urge the relevant departments to include the necessary resources in their operating budget requests starting with 2020. And we urge council to support these requests even in the face of difficult fiscal conditions and competing priorities. <clears throat> when it comes to allocating resources and other decisions such as finding space for different types of recreation or space for development, the conservation of our protected areas needs to be seen as essential as a legal and socially responsible commitment, not just one more nice to have kind of thing to be traded off under pressure. In fact, as recognized by the strategy, our natural areas need to be not only protected, but expanded through connecting corridors and buffer zones. This action is particularly welcome and it's consistent with the provincial policy statement 2014 which speaks to connectivity of natural features which should be maintained, restored, or improved. This biodiversity sets, uh, strategy sets out a roadmap for Toronto to strengthen its position as a world leader in being a livable, sustainable city. Please do your part to ensure that this strategy is adopted and implemented. Thank you. Great, Perfect. thank you very much. Uh, questions for the deputant? Deputy Mayor Minna Wong. 
So um, I, was, I was curious, you said that we need to spend the necessary money f to get all these things done. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, I was wondering if you had a comment. Um, it says that this won't cost anything in our, the report. It says there are no financial implications resulting from this report. So do you think this could, all these things can be done without spending any money? Um, no. the simple, I think one of the simple answers is that this is not a, um, this is a report that is built on a lot of other reports that have gone before. So you said the simple answer is? Th this is, uh, this report is built on a lot of other work that has gone before. Uh, yeah. The official plan, uh, the ravine strategy. Yeah. A lot of the things that um, we, um, comp I compared this report to the ravine strategy and a lot of the things that we would have asked for um, particularly to implement the biodiversity strategy are already in the ravine strategy. Um, and you may remember there was a motion in March, on March 9th, I think, what, March of, early March this year, um, requesting that, um, you, that um, when the ravine strategy comes forward, the, the, um, the, 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 the cost to implement the, the factors of the ravine strategy um, be considered that, at that time. So um, this, um, so so a lot of the things that we'll be looking to get done are um, coming to you in the in the ravine strategy. Is that helpful? Yeah. So, is is it fair to say then, that, you know, that this can't be done within existing resources? This is going to require um, significant financial requirements. No, uh, uh, not uh, significant financial requirements. I think a lot of it can be done within existing, and in fact, the strategy goes out of its way to identify um, things that staff can do within existing um, within existing um, resources. What the big one is that we would uh, we. Uh, that I look that seemed to me needed to be identified is sufficient resources to remove invasive species. Um, invasive species removal is labor intensive. It is the it is relatively specialized, and you have that expertise in urban forestry. Um, so sorry, I just can, have yeah. five minutes. Yep, sorry. So um, I, I have one question for you, for, for you, but the removal of that invasive species. Let's just take that as an example. That seems that's going to take a significant financial commitment that I don't see the existing resources within parks and forestry staff or anywhere else in our organization to I, I am finance a, that piece. I am a high park steward. One of the things that we do as high park steward is, stewards is remove those invasive species um, which um, can be done without, um, without um, mechanical, sorry, uh, machinery or or, or chemicals, um, things like garlic mustard, is something that we as High Park stewards can pull. But High Park is a very, very sensitive area, um, and we need to do that under the supervision of forestry staff. You can leverage a lot of your uh, of your volunteers who are sort of raring to go um, by um, providing sufficient supervision for them to for us to pull a lot of invasive species. Um, within our parks, um, but you really, in my opinion, you really do not want to send the public in um, to just go and pull things um, because there, um, you, you need the, we as volunteers need enough supervision to make sure that we pull the right plants. Yeah. Okay, so just, I wanted to ask this, yeah, uh, your I, friend, I think from because no, park what I wanted to ask you, ma'am, was when, when um, I said this is going to be a co cost a lot of money, you know, you kind of nodded your head yeah. yes. Yeah. So I wanted you to I wanted to know what your thoughts were. So I agree. There's a lot of multiplying effect if you can have more staff to plan and organize and supervise the work. There's all that multiplying effect of getting the community involved as stewards. But our in, our involvement in Hyde Park is limited by the availability of staff which is finite, and High Park is a somewhat special case. A lot of the environment, environmentally significant areas do not even have the degree of management plan that we have in High Park. Right. They don't have the resources working at it. They don't have a local stewardship group that we have. So there's much more to be done. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Menawong. Any other questions for the deputy? Yeah. Councillor Peruza? Yeah, just, just to pick up on this, you agree, though, that we have a qualified staff that can figure all of that stuff for, out for us, what it would cost and what our priorities might it be, yeah. and they could set down some, some firm numbers, and then we uh, pick and, and, and we, we say yay or nay to those numbers. You, you, you I think that as councillors, th then you, you receive reports from staff and, and, you are, and you pass them in council or you don't, that's. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so, so you come here and you point something out to us and then we, through, with them, sort of figure out whether or not we were gonna raise taxes to do it or not, right? Well, or shift priorities. I mean, there's always priorities. difficult decisions okay. to be made. We understand that. Um, as, as Paul Scrivener said earlier, if it was on fire and you could see it burning, you would react. This is a different kind of, of destruction, but it's, it, you know, and, and also with the awareness that people have, like you can go through our ravines and say, oh, they were all green. You know, you drive up the Don Valley, it looks all green. You don't know that that's all dog strangling vine, which is just choking it and, and ruining, ruining it for habitat and, you know, so, it, it, will, it will cost resources, and I think it's important for staff to know that they can ask for them. Perfect, thank you. Um, yeah. okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Pruz. Any other questions for the deputy? No, thank you very much. Uh, Leslie Gooding? That's me. Oh. Thank you. John Bossoms, Midtown Ravines Group. Thank you. Thank you for coming. I'd like to, uh, uh, we've, we submitted a letter which is basically very much along the lines of uh, uh, what Councillor uh, Min and Wong was just saying. Uh, the, this is a great strategy. Uh, we applaud what's written in the report. Uh, it sets out uh, excellent goals, uh, but they're not going to be met if the city doesn't commit funds to support an action plan that will actually deliver. Uh, let me just give you an example of Japanese knotweed in uh, the ravine that was on, on the slide that you saw earlier. Uh, there, uh, the city, uh, sponsored a couple of community days, which uh, uh, Councillor Cole uh, struck me as one of the best ways in which to raise awareness and knowledge uh, because the city staff that were there educated the 25 or 30 people that came out to each day uh, as to what the knotweed was, how to cut it, how to deal with it, and then followed up after that education program, which had the effect of weakening the plants uh, with then herbicide uh, that killed the weakened plants. Successful, uh, was successful in increasing awareness, successful in actually dealing with a large stand of Japanese knotweed, but the only one that could be done uh, in that year and this year. Uh, the uh, result is that we have approximately 45 other patches in that, in the part of the ravine that extends from St. Clair down to uh, Mount Pleasant Road, uh, just off Young. Uh, and uh, to say that th that one patch eliminated is enough is nowhere near realistic. Biodiversity is a really important concept. Uh, the, uh, when we have uh, our ravines taken over largely by one species like uh, like uh, Norway maples. What that opens us up to uh, is uh, a ravine that gets deforested at some point uh, when uh, nature evolves the predators that will take that species out. That's what happened to our ash trees in the ravine. Almost all the ash trees uh, died uh, and the only thing that saves the ravine from looking devastated is the fact that the ash trees were only a small number of the trees in the ravine. Uh, have make all the trees in the ravine, or a large chunk of them, 60% of the trees, Norway maples. And then, you know, when nature does evolve that predator, uh, you're gonna have ravines without trees. 
Biodiversity really is important. And the only way the city is going to be able to implement a plan uh, to affect uh, a, a realistic strategy is by putting money on the table to actually do that. So uh, you know, I applaud your question, Councillor Nguyen Wong. Uh, the, the, the problem with the city as we see it is that we have a lot of strategies being produced, but very little council support for actually implementing plans. And it's you, councillors, that we hold responsible for this, not the staff. The staff are providing good advice to you, uh, but they're not getting the funds that are required to deliver an effective action plan. That's it. Well, okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, questions for the deputant? Councillor Cole. Absolutely. It's in the ravines. Uh, that's right. And, and that's going to take trained personnel from the, the city staff and then uh, deploying other people to actually do the uh, pulling and the replanting. So it's really going to cost uh, quite a bit of money to uh, have these boots in the ravines. That's right. Uh, the, the city staff can be levered by bringing in and educating members of the public to help in this. I mean, you know, there's a lot of free labor that we would all like to provide to help, but we need the city staff to be able to direct it. I mean, let's face it, I mean, I, I agree that knowledgeable people can go in and pull out Norway maples, but most of my neighbors don't know the difference between a Norway maple and a sugar maple. And if they just are poking out trees that are maple trees, they're going to be picking out a lot of native species as well as invasive species. Uh, we do need the involvement of city staff that are knowledgeable. And we do need programs between city staff and, and UT Forestry and other people that are knowledgeable to help lever this. But that takes funds. For, uh, we need, the staff has to be increased or we're not going to get anywhere on this. Okay, thank you, John. Any other questions for the deputant? Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Susan Aaron. Um, I'm here to support the biodiversity strategy, which I have input to as a volunteer. Um, and I think it's related to other uh, items you have in the agenda, which is the uh, ecological integrity monitoring and the biophilic network. But um, my background first, very clearly, I have 20 years experience as a, in the community stewardship program. Um, I am probably the second and the only uh, of the, the, la the longest of the sites. So we have made that an environmentally significant area. And um, the other um, uh, background that I have, I've done recently uh, graduate work in the department, the faculty of forestry at the U of T. I've looked at the city's policies that protect those ravines. Um, I've looked at how they fail the ravines. Um, and I've looked at, um, uh, the ravine uh, revitalization study in relationship to integrating community. And what I found through all of those is that if the biodiversity strategy um, is passed as it stands, it will allow us to consider um, the overall uh, most important um, placement of biodiversity as the basis of life in the city. I think it has the potential to do that, which we need in light of climate change and just all the health and et cetera that's mentioned in the biodiversity strategy. But what I wanted to look at today also was that um, having seen firsthand and consider these, I see some of the failings of our policies that they are not and do need the monitoring very clearly. We know, the stewards know, the scientists know, and the city does know in what little um, efforts it can do, what efforts it can do. 
that um, the invasive plants, including the knotweed, which I deal with hands-on, um, and scientifically through the um, uh, processes that are allowed for, um, will um, destroy the ravines. But I'm going to stick to what I'm uh, reading here. Is that the um, the policies that um, we have need to be um, integrated fully. So the biodiversity strategy needs to be done. You need money for it. You have to use the uh, uh, staff and the strategies that are in existence. But as we've seen, these strategies are slow to come into practice. What has to happen is that all the departments, a variety of departments, have to be in discussion with each other using the relevant monitoring, knowing what goes on on the ground. So you can't just integrate existent urban cultures, such as the recreational amenities, um, even you know the existing bylaws. All of this has to be integrated so that the biodiversity strategy has the ability to protect, protect and engage across um, the ravines and into the city's green infrastructure. So what I'm asking you to look at today is that um, the biodiversity strategy be acknowledged, be funded, and be integrated more closely with the, uh, an understanding um, of staff and community of what goes on, the very example of the stewarding program, but also the example of what currently is being allowed for in the ESAs. It, it's a, uh, an understanding that um, if undertaken by the strategy and then funded um, in pockets or I am not in position at this point to speak to the funding, but just that our policies built upon the biodiversity strategy are going to give us the um, infrastructure that we need to respond to climate change and to create an underlying focus of um, biodiversity in the city for our health. I can speak to a uh, lot more detail if that's oh. of interest. Are, is that, are you finished? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, questions for the deputant? No? Okay. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay, thank you. Okay. Questions of staff? Councillor McKelvey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have five questions, so I'll try and talk fast. Uh, the first is TRCA is listed as a partner in more than 10 of the actions, but the provincial government has been saying that TRCA should, and all our conservation authorities should only be acting within their legal mandates. So could you just uh, maybe elaborate, do invasive species fall under, under that, or are they limited to flood protection? There we go. Thank you, Councillor, through the chair. Um, we're still seeking clarification on what the provincial government has meant by our mandate letters, so we're going to continue to work with the pro province on receiving confirmation on that. And right now, though, you receive very little funding from the provincial government, and work that you do in the City of Toronto is funded almost entirely by the City of Ontario. Uh, sorry, it, the work you do in Toronto is almost entirely funded by the City of Toronto? That is correct. So should they say that this is not within their mandate, um, even though we are footing the bill for that, does that allow us to proceed in partnership with the TRCA? It does. If a program has been indicated as non-core, then we are permitted to enter into a service level agreement with the municipality to undertake those services. Okay, thank you. Um, my second question, line of questioning revolves around the ravine strategy, which I am extremely excited is coming back to us in November. Um, I'm just wondering, I know through that you've done very extensive prioritization of our ravine systems and where we need to act first as they are um, the most pressing. Um, can you just speak to how invasive species was included in the development of that prioritization? The, with the framework that is in the ravine strategy, it is detailed in the strategy, but basically uh, we looked at high quality areas, areas that needed to be protected, 
that had uh, species of concern um, as well as our ESAs. So the invasive species wasn't in particular included in that framework, but the things that are of threat or by invasive species was included in that framework. So we prioritized around what we wanted to protect. Okay, and then for that report back then, um, will that also include um, funding requirements, some of that that would be des designated to invasive species work? Uh, th through, through the chair, uh, the report will be looking at a number of funding considerations right across the board, uh, invasive species being part of that larger sort of uh, fund funding overview. And then specifically to the biodiversity strategy that is in front of us, and, and people spoke to it earlier that it doesn't have necessarily new money attributed it, but it does have these actions. Is there, a, um, is the thought that we could have some sort of scorecard where we could be reporting back on this and on a regular basis on, on the status of these actions? We certainly would be monitoring and we would update, uh, I think it's one of the actions there that we would update the website and that keep people informed through that. And um, also through the ecological integrity framework, we would set up a protocol for monitoring. And so the ecological framework, would that have, for example, like a schedule and would break down some of these actions and things into you know timelines that we could maybe start to have some accountability around? Yes, through the chair, potentially we could do that. Um, and then my last questions are a little bit sp more specific. So the first is about tree permits building on um, the deputation that we received by Miss um, Mikalski. Um, what, what is the process for updating our tree permit system and when could we feed a request for study like that into the, into the process? Uh, through through the chair, I, I'm going to ask uh, forestry staff to uh, answer specifically around the specifics of the the tree bylaw. Uh, keeping in mind, there's actually two different bylaws. There's the private tree bylaw, and then there's the ravine and natural features protections bylaw. Each of which have different specifications around uh, how and the and the criteria around tree removal. Um, so I, I think, given the uh, the deputant. We can certainly look at that within the bylaws uh, for the next time we bring the bylaws back for review, uh, which wouldn't be immediately, but it's something we can consider and Daniel can take you through the specifications in that, in that right now. So the, um, the fees that were quoted um, on, in one of the presentations relate back to the city's private tree bylaws and city tree protection bylaws. The ravine and natural feature protection bylaw does not currently have any fee associated with it. Um, it's necessary that um, the public go through a permitting process for some of the reasons also mentioned during the presentations, mainly being the, um, the identification and proper removal of the correct species as opposed to um, more desirable uh, native species. Thank you. And then my final question is about green roofs and, and similarly, what is the, the process for updating that? And I ask in the context of how does it overlay with what's proposed in this biodiversity strategy on, on the one hand? And, and secondly, I just did a tour of, of an, a rooftop garden and they were saying that there's requirements for overwintering that doesn't necessarily fit for agriculture. So it looks like it needs multiple updates. So what would be the time frame or mechanism for updating against the biodiversity strategy, for example? Yes, through the chair. Uh, we are on our work program is a review of the green roof bylaw in 2020. And we would address issues like making sure that urban agriculture is permitted as part of the, the process. And also that we look for more additional ways to encourage biodiversity on green roof plantings. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, questions for staff? Councillor Cole? on uh, your uh, private property, um, is, uh, what's the fee for removal, tree removal on private property? Through the chair, the fee is um, $117 and change for um, a privately owned tree that's greater than 30 centimeters in diameter. So whether it's a silver maple or whether it's a swiddler maple or, or a spruce tree, the same uh, fee uh, exists for the invasive species as the native species. 
Yes, that's correct. The only addition to that would be for trees located within Ravina Natural Feature Protection Areas. It's a defined limit um, that, that does not have a fee associated with it. So it, would it be feasible to consider perhaps a discount or some uh, encouragement uh, and not, or some way of not treating uh, the invasive species the same way you treat the native species? Um, Is through, that too complicated in terms of? Through, through the chair, that's, it's a very complicated revision to the bylaw that would require some, some uh, extensive research and thought around how that could be presented. Uh, just because the types of, you know, such as a Norway maple, there are many, many Norway maples in the city that are, many of them are quite big, and as the deputants did uh, illustrate, are actually contributing to the tree canopy and, and provide some substantial coverage. So uh, it's certainly something we could look at if directed, but again, it would be a very complicated um, uh, sort of review of the bylaw to undertake it in that way. Yes. Uh, just in terms of um, uh, people talked about the need for resources, uh, I know recently uh, we received quite a substantial amount of money from the federal government along with our own money uh, to uh, invest in our sewer infrastructure. You know, we're doing the Midtown uh, Sewer Infrastructure Program, I think it's $150 million, $140 million, and then we did the one in Black Creek. Uh, how many million is that? So to $220 million has been uh, invested in a very needed uh, upgrade of our sewer system uh, to relieve uh, contamination of our uh, lake water and also to relieve basement flooding. So that, that's been, uh, you know, uh, almost $400 million uh, invested in that just recently, and it's very needed. Uh, and as you know, our, sewer, our uh, ravines are, are, are also natural sewers. Uh, that if it wasn't for the uh, ravines, you can imagine the flooding problems we would have in the city, because I think they cover 20% of our land mass. Has there ever been any infrastructure money uh, invested in uh, maintaining the integrity of our natural uh, sewer system, that is our ravines? Has there ever been an allocation of capital dollars into the parks budget to uh, enhance, protect, and uh, uh, continue uh, the, the working of our natural sewers, our ravines. Through the chair, um, through Toronto Water, for already more than a decade, we have received several million dollars annually uh, toward planting in areas that are um, that have a lot of pavement and asphalt and roof coverage, such as industrial areas, and slopes where there's a lot of runoff. And so forestry has for years been planting on slopes and in industrial areas, particularly, or high pavement and, and rooftop areas uh, with funds from water. Uh, through the chair, I, uh, I'll add just a few more things. So yes, there's a contribution annually of $2 million for tree planting in, in ravines and, and in sites that uh, help deal with stormwater management and help restore the ravines. In addition to that, um, there are uh, some programs that the Toronto Region Conservation Authority has been running that deal with erosion control that did receive also some uh, disaster mitigation assistance funding relief from the federal government. So those programs were announced as well. Um, so that will be happening in the Humber River Shed in particular, some of the Mimico areas. In addition, Toronto Water has money that it, it puts in every year to protect ravines, to protect the infrastructure that it operates, but we have a lot of our infrastructure within in the ravines. ravines, so we always, whenever we're doing work, we go in, fix our infrastructure, but it also uh, improve the uh, aquatic habitat and the, and the area that we're dealing with. So again, we just mentioned these two uh, investments this year of uh, almost $400 million. How many millions have we received for uh, uh, natural uh, sewer infrastructure that our ravines uh, are undertaking. Well, how many million? Five, ten million? What, do we, what, have we, what kind of investment have we you put in? Last, last question. We're at five and a half minutes. Through, through the chair, if you're asking, um, Councillor, around external funding around, yes, uh, there's, there hasn't been any external funding directly to Parks, Forestry, and Recreation. 
towards the item that you're speaking of. That there has been funding to Toronto Water that from water to uh, parks that, that and, um, and extra TRCA funding from Toronto well. Water that has certainly assisted in in the uh, in what you're speaking of. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Other questions for staff? Deputy Mayor Min and Wong. Yeah, so um, I kind of alluded to this in the question. So I was surprised that this is all these all these um, things. This whole report isn't going to cost. There are no financial implications. Can you confirm that? Somebody uh, through the through the chair. Uh, financial implications to PFNR, as noted, we will be coming back with the ravine strategy implementation in November, uh, which uh, will have some costs associated with some of those recommendations. So what we have done our best to do uh, is incorporate the existing work we have and left this strategy guide and, and help us prioritize the work that we do within the existing budgets that we have. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to translate that. So there are financial implications. Through the chair, we're not, uh, we're not uh, requesting any additional uh, funding through the adoption of this report. There are some very specific things we're looking at that connect specifically to the ravine strategy that will be incorporated into the ravine strategy implementation report. So there are no financial implications to adopting this report. I'm going to work this answer, um, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's important. Because I'm because I, I I don't think anybody can read through this report, Mr. Chairman, and not believe that there aren't going to be substantial costs to the city and it comes for free. So there are downstream, sorry for the, uh, I apologize for the pun, but downstream there, if we were to actually implement these strategies, there will be significant costs or are you saying this can all be done within existing budgets? It, I, I don't think it's an unfair question because when you adopt the strategy, you adopt the whole, pa I mean you are, by implication, Mr. Chairman, adopting a whole bunch of consequences afterward if you want to follow everything through. There's a, there's a follow-up from staff. Through, through the chair. Um, from city planning's perspective, I would say that the initial adoption of the strategy will have no impacts because most of the work is being captured within our existing work program and work that's being undertaken. As more detailed work perhaps evolves, we will report out on that, and if there is any individual um, impacts from a financial perspective, we would be reporting that to council. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry I have to take the crowbar out, but I do. I understand, you know, I understood both answers, the fr and they said there's no initial cost. Like, I 100% get that, but but I'm talking downstream, and, and, and uh, maybe this, because, you know, the staff behind me are, maybe aren't, understanding my question, maybe I'll ask this question of the deputy city manager. Downstream, if we were to adopt the strategy, because when you adopt a strategy, unless you're just adopting it, you're not going to follow through with it. Why do, you, why do you do it at all? Downstream, if we adopt and, and actually execute the strategy to get all these things done, to remove these invasive species, to get rid of the trees, to improve our ravines, that's con there's going to be a significant price tag to that, is there not? Mr. Chair, yes, there will be. In the, in the follow-up implementation plans, there will be costs associated with being able to undertake uh, some of the strategic actions that are identified in the strategy. This is just adopting the strategy. Subsequent to that, the implementation plan will have costing associated with it. Okay, so my next question to the Deputy City Manager, Mr. Chairman. Do you think that for, for the purposes of this report. And I know one deputy, um, an older gentleman said, this is, you know, you gotta put your money where your mouth is. I'm, 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 I'm kind of paraphrasing what I thought um, his, one of his main themes was. Do you think that we should be saying in this, if, in this report, there's no financial implications? Do you think that's responsible? Do you think that's reasonable? Do you think we should say, be saying, you know, while we adopt the strategy that there are gonna be significant do you think that that is actually a more, let's say, truthful, transparent, accountable thing to say, rather than saying, you know what, this is a freebie, it's not, you know what, 
It's not going to cost anything. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, I think that what our financial impl implications section of our staff report does is talk about the specific report that's in front of you. So by adopting the specific recommendations that are in front, and they're very specific, uh, that's just to endorse the strategy, and, and say you then don't implement any future uh, plans or actions, then there are no costs. So that's unfortunately the way we typically write a report. This one in front of you has no specific financial implications or extra monies asked for by council. We're not seeking additional authorities or monies. That, that could happen later as we report back, but we need some direction from uh, committee and council that they accept the strategy, they like the direction that we're heading, and then we could go back and cost those, uh, those specific but programs or any amendments that are made by council. The costing of implementing like these strategies could actually run in the tens of, mil tens of millions of dollars easily, is that fair to say? Through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. It could be in the tens of millions of dollars. Okay, I think, um, can I, I think your points. Yeah, no, I, I'm gonna move on made. to something else. So most of these strategies, like, uh, you know, I reviewed most of them. So I, I, um, so I, I put them in buckets. So most of the um, recommendations I, I can look at, their policy changes, their training initiatives, and, and their legislative changes. But within the capture of the, the strategy, there aren't any, actually really any hard decisions that actually, you know, in terms of the city, going in and let's say digging up the weeds or pulling out the trees or going into the ravines and actually doing something that's gonna make it better. There's nothing in here in this report. Is that unreasonable to say? And, and maybe if there, there is, maybe you can kind of point one, of the, one thing out for me. Through the chair, um, I mean, there are a number of recommendations in the report specific to parks, forestry and recreation, keeping in mind that this report is a citywide report. It's not just around parks, forestry, and recreation. There's been a lot of discussion around, uh, you know, the, the ravines and the health of the ravines. Uh, but there are larger recommendations that have to do with the official plan, as an example, and others that will be implemented as the report goes forward. Um, I'm not sure if that's answering your question. But okay, I'll, maybe right, I can ask a different way. Is there anything we're well over five minutes. policy, training, and legislative if Any you want recommendations ask, outside of those? You want to ask for a second round? Okay, fair enough. No, you're good? I'll save it for council. Okay, great. great. Any other questions for staff? I have a few. So just following up on, on Deputy Mayor Minnewong's um, comments about funding, I'm going through sort of divisions of forestry or TRCA and some federal resiliency money that we've gotten uh, in recent times and then look at the ravine strategy and, and this strategy. And could an argument be made that um, a fair amount of this is already funded? Through the, through the chair, I'm speaking just specifically to the parks, forestry and recreation items in this. As the report uh, illustrates, um, it coincides with a lot of the strategic work that we're already doing on ravine management, on invasive species management, on a number of other areas. Um, but as the deputy, the acting uh, deputy city manager has indicated, to implement this report, uh, it would require us to, as an example in the ravine strategy, advance uh, some of those investments beyond the point that we, to, to where we are currently. We can continue on the work that we're already doing uh, and can continue in the successes of, of the investment of that work, uh, but to fully implement the strategy over time, uh, it will it likely will cost uh, some, some additional funding, and as I've indicated in the ravine strategy implementation coming forward in November, specific to PFNR and this report, we'll be illustrating what those funding impacts are. So is that a, a yes, it's partially funded now through other uh, line items? That's correct. Okay. So as an example, PFNR currently has approximately $10 million uh, around operating funds in the ravines annually, and the strategies in this report will also connect with all of that work that's being done in it. And to the chair from city planning's perspective, the actions outlined in the strategy are incorporated into our existing work program. Okay, thank you. Um, on more technical aspects of the report, I didn't see, and correct me if I'm wrong, any kind of um, recommendations or references to the feeding of wildlife, animal wildlife, which is um, 
an increasing problem in our city. And any kind of response to that or bylaw response? We certainly did. Through the chair, we did, through the chair, we do, we certainly did consult with the uh, wildlife center, and we do have under our communication action around um, addressing the issue of human and wildlife conflicts. So it's an educational piece; it's not an enforcement piece, and that that's a segue into my next uh, question. You, you, there is a reference to bylaws; I will say that, but not a lot of enforcement of any kind of of the recommendations and making. Um, bringing in consequences if if some of these are not um, if, if they're violated in some way, like draining a swimming pool into um, into a sensitive um, biodiverse area. Or something. Uh, through the chair, I, I, you know, in in many of the recommendations, they're not um, uh, the the actions are not so much in, in enforcement actions. Many of them are communication actions, education actions. Uh, volunteerism and you know advancing volunteerism in a number of areas uh, and a number of the recommendations uh, already are included in some existing bylaws that are enforceable uh, so in, on our end that's where many of the enforcement items uh, would come in, into the existing bylaws okay thank you uh, finally there's um, there's a reference I guess on page 18 uh, about uh, parks and other open spaces and um, a reference to providing opportunities for biodiversity. I see Downs View Park uh, in there. I see this uh, report is co-signed by planning. Um, I represent uh, the Downs View Park area, and right now on my desk is a planning proposal for 6,500 uh, residential uh, units, 1.6 million square feet of commercial space, and 200,000 square feet uh, retail, and that's both in the William Baker and Allen District areas. Yet I see uh, here a reference to Downsview Park uh, being an opportunity for biodiversity. So I'm trying to reconcile what planning is doing, in intensification, and the philosophy of this report. And I see them, well, to put it mildly, on two different planets. something we've been doing uh, through the chair substantially in our recent secondary plans we've included policies specific to biodiversity to encouraging them and the same for Downsview. All right we'll leave we'll leave the rest of it for council. It, sorry? Thank you for your assurances uh, Councilor Perusa. You do? Is it an important one? Okay, Councillor Perusa. Um, I just want I, 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 to, Councillor Cole touched on this. I just want to go back to this whole notion of permits and better understanding how, how someone is able to remove a tree in the ravine. Um, uh, so you need a permit for even, even removing like a little twig of a tree? Through the chair, there's no uh, DBH size limit in the Ravine and Natural Feature Protection Bylaw that differs from the private tree bylaw where there's a 30 centimeter size limit. Could you just explain that in a way that I could understand? So any, would, under the current uh, Ravine and Natural Feature Protection Bylaw, Chapter 658, all woody species are protected. Um, I, I, I got a four-year-old, he says to me, Dad, when it, don't say maybe, just say yes or no, right? Um, so can you pull out a little twig of a tree in a ravine without a permit? Technically, under the bylaw, a permit is required to remove any woody vegetation from the ravine and natural feature protection system. So if I'm gonna pull out a, a twig of a tree, I need to go and get a, a permit, correct? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and that's in all cases without exception? No, uh, there are exceptions associated with permitting. Um, a tree that is dead, for example, or a tree that's hazardous, or a tree that is uh, diseased in some way, they do not require um, a permit. Who makes that determination? The determination is made by urban forestry when the request is made through uh, our section. Okay, so 
Um, so in that case, you go out, you inspect it, if, and if you determine the tree can be removed, you can just simply with a wink say, I'll take it down. Uh, well, no, there's a, there's a form that's, that's given that officially exempts the tree from the bylaw. Okay. So if you have a school group, let's say, just hypothetically, wanting to go into the ravine and doing some, um, um, you know, sort of going after, uh, removing some of these, um, what we would call, um, uh, what we have determined to be invasive species uh, that are damaging our ravine system, uh, they wouldn't, um, would they be able to, uh, with a wink from you or a nod from forestry, remove those, uh, those trees without a permit? So through you, Chair, uh, Urban Forestry currently has a very active volunteer program where we take volunteers into the ravines to do a variety of restoration work from planting to invasive species management. Um, we also have a community stewardship program and some of the volunteers are here today uh, that come uh, on a regular basis. Those, this type of activity, invasive species management, needs to be done under the supervision and direction of staff uh, because of the other implications it could have, um, such as making sure that they're pulling the right species and not trampling uh, native uh, sensitive habitat um, in that uh, area. So we don't currently allow groups to go in on their own, um, but they are done through our programs under supervision of staff. So with your staff, a group can go into the ravine uh, and uh, with staff approval, remove trees that are determined to be invasive um, to, to the ravine. That's correct. So with sa staff approval and supervision. Staff, staff approval and supervision, okay. Um, I guess, because uh, I don't understand this very well, uh, would, would staff be okay with bringing forward a report that explains this to us uh, and uh, for us to take a look at how we might be able to make it uh, uh, easier for people who want to help us do this work, uh, do it without, um, you know, without, um, uh, you know, the hindrances of expensive permits and, and time delays and all those other things. Would you be okay with that? So th through the chair, um, um, I mean, the bylaws are very specific around the allowances and, and, and who can do what. So what you're really talking about is a review of the bylaws in, in that case, which staff, we wouldn't be supportive of a review of the bylaws specific to volunteerism. Uh, and the, the community stewardship groups. I, I think as, as we've indicated, um, there is a lot of activities that currently happen with stewardship groups in the ravines and in other areas of the city, and we're very supportive of that group and, and are really uh, thankful for the help that we get from the community in implementing some of those programs. Uh, if you want to report back on what those programs are and how we manage them, I think we'd be happy to do that if that's, if that's the request. Okay, that was your, that was your last uh, question? Yeah, essentially, that's, that would be my request, yeah. Thanks. Uh, speakers? Councillor McKelvey? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to start by thanking staff for their hard work on this biodiversity strategy, and I was speaking with them last week, and I really just want to highlight to everybody that uh, I don't think they're doing this just, just for work, but they actually truly are committed to the principles that are involved in this biodiversity strategy, so I thank them for that, as well as the very useful explanations about what ecological integrity means um, in an urban versus uh, a rural uh, or, you know, northern setting, so that was very helpful. Um, something I just want to point out very clearly to everybody is that hidden within this document, there is a valuation of what our ecosystem functions are um, for our ravines. So the ecosystem services that they provide is 822 million annually. And that is a huge number and it basically represents, you know, what is the amount of money we would have to spend for these functions if, if these ravines weren't there. And so while I am mindful that these sorts of strategies and actions do require money, um, the money that we invest will have a huge return on investment if it means that we can maintain those ecosystem services uh, to the best of their ability. And finally, I just want to say that 
Um, there is huge public interest around in, uh, invasive species right now, and it's certainly something that I've received the most engagement with on social media as a topic as we put out information to the community. They're always interested to hear about actions that are being taken in the neighborhood about dog strangling vine or any of the other species, and it's receiving huge uptake. So I think the communities are interested, they want this sort of activity to happen, they want to fight invasive species, and as many of the deputants pointed out, they'd also like to be part of the solution, and they are looking for ways that they can engage and they can participate in removal of invasive species from their communities. Uh, I really look forward to the ravine strategy in November, and in particular how it will address uh, not just you know flood protection and all those other uh, services that are provided, but also as we go into our ravines to upgrade and invest in them, that we are also at the same time strategically uh, targeting invasive species. So I really look forward to that report, and I hope those of you, especially the young students that came out to give deputations today, will come back in November to give us important feedback on those subjects then as well. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKelvey. Uh, Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you very much. I have several motions. Uh, motion one, the Infrastructure Environment Committee requests the General Manager, Parks, Forestry, Recreation, the Chief Planner, and Executive Director, of City Planning, and General Manager, Toronto Water, Water, report back to the Infrastructure Environment Committee through the Ravine Strategy Implementation Report in November 2019 regarding the review of opportunities and priority sites for restoration in the ravine and other associated project requests. To request that General Manager Parks, Forestry and Recreation and Chief Planner, Executive Director, City Planning in consultation with the TRCA and relevant city divisions identify opportunities for restoration outside of ravine areas and in the public realm through the 2021 budget process. Number two, what's up with number two? Um, that the Infrastructure Environment Committee requests the appropriate staff to consider prioritizing as part of the invasive management plan the four provincially regulated terrestrial invasive species, including Japanese knotweed. And finally, that recommendation to be amended as follows. City Council um, direct the general manager, and you'll see that there, just, just this adds the highlighted portion, including an implementation and budgetary framework, and uh, include a reporting deadline by the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, I'd like to, uh, to, to thank staff for the report and, and highlight there are, there are three things that I really love about this about this policy in front of us. One, and I'll get to it, is a neat story, a neat personal story. Two, is that it involves something that all of us care about, and that is the health of our city. The physical health, the ecosystem health, and the infrastructure health of our city. And finally, it gives us an opportunity as councillors to show our commitment for something. And I'll get to that in a second. So first, I want to tell you a story. So this, the biodiversity strategy came from a letter that I wrote in 2015 and put on the agenda. And it was only on this agenda for, for two reasons. I had a meeting with an old friend, Leslie Adams from uh, Power, which someone will remember the acronym, it's like People for Our Water, People for Our Water and Environmental Resources that have been doing fights in the province uh, for years. And she told me that um, 2011 and 2020 was the UN decade of biodiversity. Big UN declaration, the previous provincial government did some work on it, but cities hadn't done anything. And yet we have a lot of eco ecological resources in our city. We have a lot of biodiversity, but cities in, in the province and across the country weren't developing plans. And I thought that was a little silly. And then later on that week, actually, I had a conversation with, with my partner, and she uh, is an avid birder, and she told me about a, uh, a chimney coming down actually across town, but that was home, they knew, to an endangered species. And she asked me, what, what would the city do? And I said, well, who? There's no, no, no division that checks for this thing, so we would issue a demolition permit. But we have no one that actually checks that box saying, no, you're not destroying invasive, uh, and you're not destroying uh, endangered species habitat. And it struck me that someone along the way at the city could actually serve that purpose to check that box that says, this is on a 100-year-old chimney. It is very likely endangered species habitat. Um, so you have to provide documentation. We do that for a lot of other things. It just seemed like something we could do. At the same point in time, the piping pl uh, uh, plovers were, were re-establishing on Toronto Islands. Uh, and then more recently, I, had, I got to, to learn from some of the speakers here uh, about some of the invasives in our ravine system. So 
this is a really exciting strategy because it does touch on, on, on something that I think a lot of us hold dear. And we heard from Councillor Min and Wong, it's something that he has just in his own backyard, uh, that this is about the, the health of our city, our physical health, because of invasive, the, the impact that some invasive species can have on, on our physical health, our ecosystem health, because those invasive species and that habitat, that, that um, species biodiversity adds to uh, the, the, the complexity of, and, and therefore health of uh, the environment around us. And finally, our, in our infrastructure health. I got uh, the privilege of a tour uh, uh, with the folks from Moore Park and the Ravine Group in, in Ward 11 just to see the devastation uh, that is, is happening within our ravine system uh, as a result of some of these invasives, and it is going to cost us money. And Councillor Min and Wong is quite right to say that the implementation of this report, if we do it, is going to cost money. It's unfortunately not presented here because those, those money asks would be under the ravine strategy, would be under uh, strategies for invasive uh, uh, species specifically. So how do we address uh, the, the knotweed in a coordinated fa uh, fashion. How do we address the, um, uh, the, the invasive Norway maple in an in, in, in appropriate fashion? It is going to cost money. Uh, it's just the money, the dollar values aren't here in front of us yet. That's why most of my, item, my items don't say spend more money on it, is as, as the process of the ravine strategy and budgets come in, come with proposals. Um, because I, like, I, I, I completely agree with Councillor Min and Wong in that there, there are costs associated with this. Where we might disagree is I actually think we should fund programs that, that really do address the recommendations in this report so that we see uh, advancement in protection of our, of, our, uh, of our ravines and biodiversity. We need to put resources into this. Uh, um, unfortunately, the only example we have of the last time Toronto City Council had an opportunity to demonstrate our commitment to this was for a tiny half million dollar ask to clean up garbage and, and, and litter in our ravines as part of a pilot program in advance of the ravine strategy. This was, came forward in our 2019 budget process and it went unfunded. We had a motion in front of council that said fund it with a 0 0.022 increase to the property tax rate to fund this half, half million dollars, 0.022%. And unfortunately, that, that would cost Roughly speaking, under a dollar a person, well under a dollar a person. Um, so we will get a number. We will have an opportunity to hold to account the elected officials in, uh, at City Council to say, if you're serious about protecting biodiversity and saving our ravines, you got to vote for an increased resources. Thank you very much. Well, that's a, a warm up for budget season. Um, Councillor Perusa? I've got uh, no uh, Councillor Cole. Yeah, I, I have uh, three motions I'd like to move. Uh, the first one is uh, that the Infrastructure Environment Committee request that the General Manager of Toronto Water and General Manager of Parks, Forestry and Recreation in collaboration with the uh, Toronto Regional Conservation Authority to report on the vital role Toronto Ravines play in stormwater management and in dealing with the impacts of severe weather events caused by climate change. The second motion uh, that uh, requests that Infrastructure Environment Committee requests General Manager Parks, Parks Forestry and Recreation to undertake a public awareness campaign through its existing public outreach to include information about invasive species threatening our ravines and private and public open spaces. And my, my third uh, motion is uh, recommend that uh, we direct the General Manager Parks Forestry and Recreation in consultation with the Chief Planner, Executive Director of City Planning and Chief Executive Officer, Toronto and Regional Conservation Authority and external experts to A, develop an ecological integrity monitoring and reporting framework for Toronto's natural areas and ravines through the Ecosystem Services Working Group and uh, B, report back by September 2020 on their progress on the ecologically, ecological uh, integrity monitoring and reporting framework including implementation and budgetary requirements. This work will build on metrics from existing city and TRCA programs and data for monitoring change in the condition of natural areas and ravines. Um, just to speak to my motions briefly, uh, the one about the sewers, uh, I just think that uh, 
We take for granted uh, the fact that uh, our ravines, which uh, cover 20% of Toronto's landmass, are uh, playing a, a critical role in uh, absorbing uh, and managing uh, our uh, uh, water uh, outfalls, our, our, our extreme weather events. Our, uh, so without these, uh, the natural sewers, uh, you can imagine what would happen to our uh, existing uh, hard sewers and our roads, etc. So our ravines are taken for granted, and that's why by doing this report, we might be able to get some resources uh, significant resources uh, invested in our ravines to ensure they continue to play their uh, critical role in stormwater management and perhaps expand their role as these extreme weather events will continue to come uh, one after another as we've seen in recent years. Uh, uh, secondly, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the um, public awareness campaign, uh, I think uh, we've got a lot of vehicles within the city uh, of Toronto whereby we could use uh, uh, all kinds of uh, communications uh, to identify these invasive species so that Torontonians would become more familiar with what they look like and be able to identify them and be able to ask questions and uh, be able to move uh, to eventually replacing the invasive species. Uh, and also, uh, you couldn't agree more, this is going to cost a great deal of resources to do it right. And so I think it's uh, very, very uh, fruitful that we're talking about the reality of the cost of these uh, uh, motions and the cost of this uh, biodiversity report, uh, that it is going to mean a commitment of dollars to do this going forward. Uh, I, I do want to say that um, uh, we're asking this, parks, uh, recreation, forestry, to do so much, they're already doing a great deal. So with existing resources, they're not going to be able to undertake uh, everything we're asking of them in terms of dealing with our biodiversity file. So I think we're going to have to commit to some more capital dollars for sure in going forward uh, and operating dollars. Uh, uh, just, um, uh, I do, do want to mention that uh, uh, I am a, a jogger and I go through many ravines and I've, I've go through many streets and so forth. I have never seen our parks looking so clean and so green uh, as I have this year. Uh, and I, I don't know, uh, there's been uh, improved management or whatever it is, but I know they are green. There could be some invasive species in there. But I, again, I just want to commend our parks, recreation, forestry people. I have really, uh, you know, been amazed by the, uh, uh, the absence of uh, plastic and the absence of uh, foreign uh, garbage elements that come in and the, the control of our natural uh, grass areas as uh, juxtaposed to our uh, mowed lawns. Uh, and so I just want to commend staff because I know uh, I'm, and my staff, we, like I'm sure all of our counselors, we even- You could. Yeah, um, wrap up. I know we have to say something good for, change sometimes. No, I like positive I stuff, know that but you're within five minutes we like positive. Anyways, so I just want to put that on the record that uh, again, I think staff uh, is to be commended by the incredible commitment they've made uh, to keeping our parks clean and green and safe and I want to put that on the record too. Great, thank you, Councillor Cole. Uh, now, Clarity, Councillor Peruza, are you moving this item or are you withdrawing it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I've, um, as you know, I was going to move a motion on this whole, you know, permitting ravines. Can you pull out a twig without a, a you know, without a permit? You know, one person says, uh, no, you can't because you've got bylaws that don't do that. That, that, that I mean, um, bylaws that prohibit you from doing that. Another person says, well, you know, actually we can organize school groups and go down and remove them, providing they have supervision. So I, I wanted to get some clarity on all of that, but I have been... Um, somewhat moved by our very knowledgeable staff uh, that it is uh, a very complex issue that would require some bylaw reviews and, and other things. So I will take that offline with them and 
Uh, if at the end of the day I'm not convinced, then I will move my motion at a later date, uh, Mr. John. But while I do have the microphone, I'll just take another 15 seconds to say that uh, this is um, a very good report and that it, it's very good direction for us to be moving in, and I'm very, very supportive of it. Thank you, uh, Councillor Perusa. Are there any other speakers? No, we're good. So we can start voting on these motions. Um, unless you want to take, can we just take them as a package or? Package. A package? Okay. So we're going to. So motions uh, A, B, and C from uh, Councillor Layton. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And motions A, B, and C from Councillor Cole. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much. Our next item on the agenda is uh, item nine. It's held by Councillor Layton. Councillor Layton. Councillor Layton, questions for staff? No, thank you very much. Any um, item nine, number of tickets issued and charges laid against builders oh, for failure to protect city trees. So Any questions for staff? You have questions? Yeah, this is just Mayor Min Wong. When someone's building an infill house and there's a tree that's getting in the way of their infill house, do we usually let them chop down the tree? Yes, we do. The, through the chair, the, um, the requirement for a permit remains for removing a tree that's within the footprint of um, allowable zoning. It depends on where the tree is located in the context of the, of the site and what, what variances or, or um, severances might be required. All right, so maybe I'll be a little bit more speci specific. If an infill house, if there is a, an existing tree and the plan for the infill house directly conflicts, like the, is exactly where, for example, the, um, on the footprint where the new property is, the new house is, do we allow that tree to be removed? Yes. And that's all the time, right? All, all the time. Uh, it depends upon the variances on the site, but... No, no, no. Tree that's, sorry. If the variance is not approved, that's clear, mm -hmm. or if it's not... Um, in the existing footprint of the house, I think you know there could be a discussion. But if it, it actually conflicts, the, the variances are approved, and and you can't build the house because there's a tree there. We all it doesn't matter how old the tree is or what the tree is. We have a policy of letting them allowing the permit. Correct? It's it's not a policy. It's built into the bylaw. Oh, it's in, as, built into the bylaw. Right, it's called as of right construction. It's as of right construction. Okay. And if and and usually. I mean, I should probably be asking you this offline, but, um, and if it's outside that footprint, then we have, a, there's, a, there's a little bit more um, discretion involved, correct? That's correct. Oh, thanks. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Minnewong. Councillor Layton. Thank you very much. And there are just a couple very quick questions. Uh, on the chart on page three, this had to do with um, the contraventions inspected and the orders to comply, and then the part three summonses. Can you tell me what the response time is for, because um, these are all done based on complaint, correct? Most, most calls received come in through 311, that's correct. Come in through 311. I think I'm a good percentage of those calls <laughs> uh, for, for these ones in particular. Uh, the, how long is the period that it takes for you to inspect? So the, the time period for response can fluctuate throughout the year depending upon the number of calls and the seasons uh, on, on the season. So currently in 2019, we're at about five days uh, and our service standard is seven days for response. Service standard is seven days. That's right. So you get a call that a tree is being uh, on a construction site is being injured potentially and it takes five to seven days to respond. It's averaging right now five days. However, certain calls are prioritized above others. Okay. And then the orders to comply are when you see something that is in contravention of the bylaw? Uh, when, 
Yes, yeah, so orders comply are issued when there is work that can be accomplished to correct the contravention that was doc that was observed on the site. That's correct. So when there's not work that can be done, for instance, they injured the tree as a result of something, what happens in that case? Uh, so in a case of injury, there is some work that can be done. Uh, corrective measures can be put up, hoarding can be reinstalled, uh, mulch, can be, mulch can be applied within the tree protection zone. Those are all pieces of work that, this, that the city can enforce on an order to comply. But we wouldn't issue a fine right off the bat? A fine, no. Yeah. There would be an inspection fee associated with, with the contravention, but not a fine. Even if, even if damage was done to the tree? Even if damage was done. Uh, to, to institute a fine uh, requires further legal action through uh, uh, prosecution. So then you, th then the orders to comply are when you issue orders to do some kind of remedy. Um, now the number of orders to comply and the part three sums is, 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 is rather dramatic, the, the reduction. I'm wondering if, can we ensure that all of those issues or orders to comply were investigated to ensure that they were in fact complied to? So we, we prioritize which uh, infraction sites proceed to prosecution and we do that in consultation with legal, with the evidence um, and with the significance of the impact on site. Um, so that's why there's a far fewer number of, of actual part three sums that are issued. Okay, I might figure out a way to put a motion together for council on this one, um, just because I think that that draw, we need to be, I'll, you know what, I'll speak to this next. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Uh, Councillor Peruza? I just, I want to know, uh, when do you, so the as of right construction, when do you uh, issue the permit to remove the tree? I'll tell you, I'll tell you why I asked this question. Uh, you know, a rezoning application was applied for uh, in my area s some years ago. It went through the process all the way to the Ontario Municipal Board. Uh, th they got their uh, zoning and they proceeded to remove a whole bunch of trees, like 250 trees or something. Uh, and they haven't built a single thing yet, right? I mean, they may one day build the thing, but you could have had a whole bunch of trees, uh, you know, continue on until they were actually ready to construct, right, to build. So, so, so at what point is someone, because of as of right construction, permitted to remove a tree? The, the allowance is based upon the building permit. So, so a, a permit can be applied for at any point in time, but the, the actual permit would not be approved until the building permit has been so you, you may have, it, it depends upon the, you know, the developer themselves and how they proceed with their construction timelines, but they could apply for a permit early or they could apply for it after zoning, uh, but generally urban forestry holds those permits until a, a building permit has been issued. So the as of right construction issuance of a permit, um, so, so technically you could have a situation where somebody uh, removes trees because they're in the way of construction and never actually build anything. It's too expensive. It, it, there, yeah, there's the potential for that sort of behavior, yes. Thank you. Is that, um, you're done? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Peruza. Any other questions for staff? Yeah. Any speakers on this item? Councillor Layton? Yes, just very quickly. Uh, Thanks, thank you to staff for, for reporting back. I just find that the discrepancy in the number of, I felt first, I think this problem is so frustrating. You walk by a site, these are, these are contractors that work in our city that know what the bylaws are, and then they're starting, they're, they're, they're piling stuff from, a, uh, from digging out a basement right up next to a city tree. Like that's destroying our property. Those trees are ours, not to, not, not to, Put too much ownership over nature, but they belong to the city. We pay for them. We're responsible for pruning them. If they die, we got to replace them. And these trees can be there for 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years plus. And yet these contractors that work in our city are just, a, a, some of them, not all of them, some of them are just flagrantly disregarding our bylaw. And the fact that it takes some, a, someone to report it, to, to have the wherewithal to say, that might be hurting that tree and in contravention of the City of Toronto bylaw, for it to, to take seven days 
to get someone out there, and then for us to not actually immediately levy something, some significant fine, or say, you know what, next time you go for a building permit, you're gonna have a, you're not gonna go fast track, you're gonna go slow track. Like, it's, it just seems to me, like there, there are some times when there's honest mistakes that are made, maybe if it's someone trying to do their own work around their house, but when these are contractors that do a lot of work in our city, they damn well know better. And I'm tired of making these calls in and seeing these trees get destroyed uh, by, by, by negligent work. I guess the adage, it's hard to find a good contractor, actually applies to those that will protect our trees as well. Um, I just think we need to figure out a better way of, of, of pushing back and getting, and getting compliance because clearly with, with almost with over 2,000 uh, contraventions that were inspected, so that's w the ones that were called in last year, uh, that, that's, that's too many. And so I think there's something better we can do. I just haven't thought of it yet. So maybe I'll get do it by council or maybe I won't. Thank you. There is no slow track. Maybe you can create one. Okay, extra slow track. Thank you. Wait for the tree to get, to, to revive itself or to regrow. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Any other speakers on this item? There is. It's the regular track. I'll move the staff recommend the receipt. Moving receipt. Okay, receipt is being moved. All those in favor? All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. All right, James, you got 20 minutes. Uh, Item 10, proposed wastewater energy transfer pilot projects. Um, Dennis Fotinos. So the deputy, de deputy then has a read. Uh, but he would, I would ask for an amendment to be made to the annual recommendation. Oh. Which were agreed. I have a, a, a motion from staff, but. Okay. Oh. Questions for staff? Oh. We're not on speakers, though. Um, questions for staff? I have one. Yeah. Um, Deputy Mayor Minnow Wong? Um, so I read that if the pilot project goes through that we may, we, give an, we have an agreement with this vendor because they have some sort of pr proprietary thing. And I'm just wondering, like, what is it that's so proprietary that means that, that suggests that we shouldn't, um, you know, go out for a proposal call on a technology like this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it's not necessarily proprietary as opposed to the, the vendor uh, approached us in that he had a couple of viable locations with some interested parties to explore it. Um, so we do recognize that there are uh, other competitors that may be interested in, in doing something similar in, um, in today or in future. We do know of another company uh, that has come forward with a different part of the city and so we wanted to do the pilot so we could develop a framework document, which will then allow other entities. So to do an RFP would be uh, us identifying the various locations and putting together the other users who would take the waste heat, like for example, a hospital or a college. Yeah. We're not proposing that the city get into that business. We want, we want private businesses to work out those third party arrangements all we would look at is whether it made sense from a operational technical perspective to allow them to access the sewer in that particular location and what is the framework for making those requests for companies to approach us or, or entities. So that's why we're proposing the pilot um, and why we, it was not run as an RFP. Mr. 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 Chair, you're not, but within this, as I, I think as I read the report, if the pilot's successful, then you enter an agreement with them for a longer period of time. Is that correct? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. On these two specific locations. So we're giving. Yes. We're sole sourcing on these two specific locations. Uh, again, through you, Mr. Chair. We, we did not put out a call. Uh, Toronto Water did not have an RFP out, so uh, we were, were not following a procurement type process. We are following the council approved uh, plan to uh, look at. Uh, different ways to use energy and, 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 and taking waste heat from sewage was identified in, in one of our transform TO's uh, policy strategies. That was open-ended to allow uh, entities to approach us with proposals as opposed to us making the respective calls. Uh, and so we're responding to a company coming forward and saying we have 
interested parties that want to explore it. You use the term sole source, yes? You use that. I'm saying we did not have a tender call, <laughs> and so we we are the not version. issuing. What do you call it when you don't have a tender call and you give a contract out? It's an unsolicited proposal. Oh, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> so so essentially, it's an unsolicited proposal. Works. However, we do have a framework to consider it. The council uh, asked us to look at, in in general, a look at waste heat recovery and other energy measures. Are there are there any? So two sites. What are the two sites? Uh, the two sites that were specifically identified in the recommendations, uh, one is the Sunnybrook Hospital site. Yeah. Uh, the second Humber one College. is Humber College and the uh, associated uh, nearby is the Etobicoke, William Osler Etobicoke uh, General Hospital site. So Those two are really close to one another. So you're comfortable with doing the sole source? Again, this unsolicited proposal. <laughs> I have no proposal call out there. So I'm not so There's sourcing. another arrangement when someone comes with an idea. What's it called? Uh, uh, it was the partnership office used it. The name escapes me. Um, no, no. When someone comes with an unsolicited proposal. Swiss challenge. Swiss challenge. How come we didn't do a Swiss challenge on this one? Because uh, the, at the end of the day, um, you, you can only have one proponent engaging the outside party. So, for example, this company is already, uh, already has in place agreements in principle with Sunnybrook Hospital oh. uh, to work together. So uh, it was based on the fact that they had already made progress okay. with these outside parties that, that we said, all right, we would look at it. There are other companies that are looking at this beyond this particular company, and if they had proposals, we would look at them as well. But we, we, we do need to develop a, a policy framework the city of uh, Vancouver did develop one, and we've looked at that. However, we, we do need to look at how we would do it in Toronto. And so you're, you and the procurement officer satisfied with this arrangement? I threw you. We're working with the energy office and, and legal, not procurement, because, again, we did not have a tender call out there. We would make money on this, in fact. So there's a potential for Toronto Water to earn revenue off of, uh, uh, off of this proposal. I'm, ju I'm just... So, so you ha this hasn't been re reviewed by Michael Patrick's office? No, again, because we are not procuring any anything. It's not like Toronto Water put out a tender call. We're not buying the equipment. There's, uh, we, we are not purchasing anything. There is no investment on our part. All of the investment will be handled by the third parties. But we're, they're giving access to a city, city, a city site, yes? Uh, through, through you, yes, they would get access in return there would be some revenue that we would expect uh, for, for using the waste heat and, and the lease agreement. So that is the basis of, of the agreement that we're going to look at uh, putting in place with the pilot. But first we need to make sure uh, that implementing something like this does not cause us operational problems with our sewers. So that is really the, the key operational concern that Toronto Water has and we need to go a bit further to explore those, those issues. Could you send this to the procurement office to have them have a look at it? Could we? Yeah. We could send it to them, but again, we're not procuring anything. Well, you're, you're, you're actually giving them access to a site that others don't have access to. Again, we did so under, money. under uh, city council policy. Uh, Bill, you want to go through? Uh, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, the council has already established and approved a policy of the Green Market Acceleration Program. Um, whereby these types of projects um, can be undertaken uh, if there's no cost to the city. So, and it's exactly that, where you are giving access to city resources uh, so that the city can try out new technologies as well as um, having a look at new and innovative technologies and helping out some of our local. You're saying that you said the city's not making, so what the city, you said the city's not what? Pushing through the door. Well, when I allow, so, there are a lot of circumstances where we're not paying for the infrastructure. For example, I don't know, I let a food truck go on the square. I'm not making any money, but there's a process for that. Yes, and that's what we're saying. There's a process for this as well. Right. That council's approved, and we're following that. that, that All right, fair enough. I'll take, I'll take it up with the uh, I, I, I have a quick question office. on this. Oh. Okay. I don't um, know. Do you have to? Yes. <laughs> okay, Councillor Perusa. I guess, I guess, uh, I'll ask the question for 
Councillor Manon-Wong, then how do we figure out at the end of the day whether we're getting best value? So we're going to make some money. Um, how, how do we, um, how were we able to determine that, um, that this particular outfit is giving us the best value for the access that we're giving them? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, that is the reason why we're asking to do the pilot. We're going to develop some of the criteria that would inform a broader policy, um, but we have to start somewhere, and we've been approached by this particular uh, company uh, to look at doing uh, sewer recovery work. We do know that you need external party arrangements uh, with people that will buy that waste heat, and they've got letters from Sunnybrook uh, initially, and now also a Humber. So that is part of the work that we would do, is figuring out what is the value of the waste heat, uh, try to develop a market valuation number for that, compare it to other things that have been done in other jurisdictions, as well as what we've done on the opposite side. Deep lake water cooling is a form of energy transfer. So we would look at that agreement that we have in place with N-Wave. Okay. So, so these two particular sites, at the end of the day, may not give us best value, but they would give us some benchmarks by which to achieve best value going forward. That's correct. It's, it, you have to start new programs, and, and the, uh, uh, the council policy was trying to give us the ability to do some innovative work. That's the first time we're, uh, we're trying it in the city, uh, so we, we need to take it a bit further, and we need council's authority uh, to do that work, to, to try to figure out some of these details. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Peruza. Uh, any other uh, questions for staff on this item? Oh, uh, just in terms of, uh, I think there was uh, a need to include the reference to the hospital next door to the uh, Humber College, that is the uh, William Osler Hospital uh, site, should be uh, Etobicoke site. Uh, th th through you, Mr. Chair, that's correct. And I believe uh, Councillor Layton has a motion oh, to make yeah. that, okay. that specific amendment. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Cole. Um, deputations are over. Uh, speakers, Councillor Layton. Yes, I have a motion that was given to me by staff um, that we add to recommendation one and or William Osler Etobicoke General Hospital to the list of proposed pilot sites. So we've got a program at the city called the Green Market Accelerator Program. Someone came to us and said, we know you're not looking. Sure, that's no problem. Well, you could ask questions to the mover. I'm not gonna know the answer, but I'll try. I don't know why these are on the list and not others, but that would be my question. The, the, uh, the other question is, I, I just want to better understand our, our sewer system, um, I, in, because what this seems to suggest is, and I don't know what the sewer network is at, at Humber College, uh, for example, or where it comes out onto the city, uh, and how big that sewer is, and how much heat that would generate. Uh, but uh, now, uh, adding this other uh, place, it might be going into the same sewer, uh, but now you're sort of, that's, you know, saying what, uh, uh, what Councilman and Wong was alluding to is m maybe we should allow the pilot to go forward on the, the, the two sites, see what the values are, uh, establish those, and maybe we might be in a better negotiating position on the third site, right? Uh, and so instead of just kind of like slipping it in there, I think the two is, to, to you, Mr. Yeah. Chair, just so we had clarity. Uh, that was an error on staff's part in that uh, we did not include that name in the recommendation when the discussions that we've been having with the proponent that that, uh, because it is in the same sewer and beside Humber, it was always intended to be there. So this is to clarify the discussions that we've had uh, with the company. Uh, so it was our error in not including it in the original recommendation. Otherwise, we would have had it in the staff report. So, so the site that you're talking about, where, that you're picking both sewers, both the, 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 the sewer from Humber, the main sewer from Humber, I'm assuming, and the, and the sewer from Etobicoke General Hospital, but they're both going into the same pipe. It would be coming off of the same sewer segment, yes. Okay. 
So you wouldn't be able to se uh, you wouldn't be able to separate it anyway. They would need an agreement with the Tobacco in, in, in any case. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, yes, this this only works if you have someone that wants to buy the waste heat off of the company that's going to make the investment. Mm. So you need an interested third party. If that deal falls through, there will be no sewer heat recovery project because there is there is no third party transaction that will occur. Okay, thank you, Councillor Perusa. Um, just some clerical a uh, clerical item. Um, lunch is in nine minutes. Do you want to um, move to complete the agenda or, or continue to finish? I'll move to complete the agenda. Move to complete the agenda is on the table. Those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, we're back to speakers for item 10. If, if I could just, I, I've, I've tabled the motion, I'll be very brief. Uh, this is precisely the type of project that the green market acceleration program that the city developed is intended to support. Someone came to us and said, you're losing a bunch of heat on your sewage line as, as you take it back to get, uh, to get treated. I'd like to, I'd like to pay to install something that will, that will take some of that heat off uh, and, and, and heat a local bu a building with it, thereby reducing the, um, the, the, in all likelihood, requirement for natural, nat uh, natural gas heating. Um, it's a technology that's used elsewhere, but not in Toronto. And so we need to develop a, a, a framework when people come to us. When people, if someone came to you and said, I want to buy a little bit of the heat from your sewage pipe that you're not using, I'm going to pay you for it. I'm going to pay for everything that goes into it and then pay you for it. Like there might be a lot of complicated things we aren't factoring in, so we shouldn't just open it all up to everyone. Uh, things like agreements around the right of way, uh, the, uh, the, the impact that how much heat is being taken off uh, the system or unanticipated things that, uh, the, that happen in Toronto sewer system that they might not have experienced elsewhere. Um, so we, we want some time to beta test this. Um, it just so happens that someone came to us saying we have these agreements with these other institutions, we would like to set, uh, set up a pilot in this way. Um, if we wanna see movement and innovation coming out of the city, this is ki the kind of thing we should look at. It, it, it passes the smell test, because if it's demonstrated it's being used on sewers elsewhere. It, uh, there, there is money changing hands and it brings in revenue to the city. Uh, and it's an established policy goal that we have from our trans uh, from Transform TO. So I, I think that this is a good step forward. Um, I, I'm, there was one other site that I would have loved to see on that list that's actually in my ward. Unfortunately, it's not, it's okay. Uh, but we'll, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that this is taking the next step forward and uh, I hope that it works out. And if it doesn't, well, we tried. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Any other speakers? Okay, we have the one motion. Put it on the screen. All those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. The item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. Item number 11, held by Councillor Layton, 2020 Canada Ontario Agreement respecting Great Lakes water quality and ecosystem health. Mr. Chair, in the, staff? In, in the interest of time, unless there's questions of staff, I'm happy to move receipt of the program. Thank staff and apologize for uh, if they uh, stayed longer than they had to, just, just in the interest of us finishing the agenda in the rough time frame that we had uh, expected. Okay. Um, all those, all those in favor, motion to adopt. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Item number 12, congestion management plan status report. I why I would hold on. Questions for staff? I, I held it. I think I held it on someone's behalf. Right. Oh, it's Councillor Menawak. Okay, let's, let's, um, right. Okay, it was a walk-on item from Councillor uh, Men and Wong, all those in favor? Opposed, that is carried. Final item, also a walk-on item, e-scooter oversight and management. E-scooters. Um, questions for staff? Um, questions for staff? Just, just very quickly. Councillor Layton. Staff are working on a regulatory framework for the City of Toronto that is consistent with the provincial 
um, uh, the provincial framework, but it's just they hadn't developed it yet, correct? That's correct. There was a previous motion that came through this committee that staff should work on a regulatory framework for e-scooter, kick e-scooters, as well as other similar types of micro-mobility, so we've been working on that. The province is now uh, announced that they will be in doing a pilot project, and so we will be feeding into that pilot project, and, and we need some regulations in the meantime. So currently, is it legal to, according to the provincial framework, is it legal to ride an e-scooter on the road? No, it is not. It is not. And therefore, it wouldn't be legal to ride an e-scooter on the sidewalk, would it? The sidewalk definition is a little bit um, more um, more vague, and so that's why there's a motion within your package today that uh, explicitly makes it illegal to ride an e-scooter on the sidewalk. And for parking the vehicles on the sidewalk, what would our current what would our current regulations say about blocking it up or or just leaving it on the sidewalk, blocking the right of way? There are currently stipulations in our bylaws that if a, a e-scooter or other or if, if devices or items are left in the right of way that obstruct sidewalk travel, then they, they could be confiscated and removed. Um, the language in the motions that you have in front of you makes that explicitly clear for e-scooters that they can't be left on the sidewalk as an obstruction. And how long do we think it'll take for, um, for staff to come, for the province to determine the regulatory framework and then for staff to come back with, uh, with something? Through the chair, the province seems to be moving quite quickly on this as they um, only a couple of weeks ago announced a, a pilot that will under be taken for five years and they had only a two day comment period. They've since revised that to a comment period until um, next uh, later this week, so we will be commenting. Um, they, they may move very quickly on that and we wanna make sure that our bylaws um, allow us some, a bit of a reprieve until we have a framework in place that has permitting systems. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Mena Wong. Thanks. Um, recommendation number two says you're not allowed to put, e you're not allowed to park e-scooters on a street, sidewalk, or pedestrian way. Where exactly are they supposed to park them? The language in this recommendation would allow an individual who wants to use an e-scooter to use it on the road once the province makes the changes to the Highway Traffic Act, but when you would take it with you into your destination, your home, your workplace, that kind of thing, an e-scooter is quite a small device. Um, it would not allow commercial proliferation of e-scooters on our sidewalks until we have a permit system in place to allow where they can park and cannot. Is So, I mean, I'm not... I may not be opposed to recommendation they, they num number one and number three. My other concern is um, cause this, because when we talk about e-scooters and all the, these type of sort of vehicles, it's not without a certain level of controversy and there seems to be a certain level of people who want a number of people that wish to come here and make their views known and this was just dropped on us. I, I just don't want to run afoul of people saying, you know, we didn't have any notice of this arrangement you know, people usually, the cyclist or the scooter community usually likes to know about these things and here we just dropped it and no one really knows. And I'm just wondering whether, um, you know, will there be some people who use e-scooters or would there be some stakeholders or what have you who might not agree with recommendation number two? Uh, through the if that's the case, they should be able to, to voice their concerns. Voice their concerns, yeah. that's my point. Through the chair, we are just working around the timelines that the province announced this pilot, and we want to make sure our bylaws are clear that they would that the sidewalks and streets would not be obstructed by e-scooters left there, which we've seen happen in other cities. Um, so, what we're proposing here would allow people to use e-scooters, but would protect us from having them being strewn about the sidewalks um, and creating um, accessibility and pedestrian hazards. Some folks might have some problem with that, right? This recommendation. Uh, we would seek, some people may have concerns, and, and this recommendation also allows us, um, it says that we would be coming back before the end of the year with a, for a framework with a permitting system that would allow larger use of e-scooters and where they would park. Um, just to go back to the first okay. recommendation. I'm finished. Thank you, um, uh, Deputy Mayor. Any other questions for staff? I have a couple, but... Um, so when it comes to e-scooters, 
parking Ill illegally on, on the places we've, uh, we've mentioned, uh, e-scooters are used by individual residents and citizens in a private contract with an e-scooter company. How would we ever be able to enforce any kind of violation of leaving e-scooters in the public right of way? With the provisions of the bylaw as written here, we would be able to confiscate e-scooters that were improperly left on the right of way. Um, an individual who wants to use an e-scooter that they own could, could bring that into their, their property or where they're going because they are quite small and they fold up. This allows us to protect the city against having mass commercial use of e-scooters on our sidewalks until such time as we have a permitting system that would allow them to park in particular places. So the, the penalty is confiscation. There's no warning, there's no fines, it's confiscation. We take, we take the product and we impound it. In the manner that we're trying to enact something quickly to protect ourselves from this change we anticipate to happen from the province, it would allow us to just confiscate them. I'd, in practice, what we have for bicycles that are left in the right of way, um, if they're, as long as they're parked but they're, they're not rideable, we do put warnings. So I expect we'll work with staff to create something similar if it's not obstructing travel. If it's obstructing travel, confiscation needs to happen so that that can be out of the way. What about uh, private property? I understand the distillery district has proceeded with a, a pilot. Um, do we have any authority or, or enforcement ability on private property? No. We do not. What about federal lands? Um, I'm thinking under the Downsview Secondary Plan or Downsview Park. Um, would they govern it themselves? Um, within federal lands, if there are roads that are city operated, that would be um, that would be under the city's authority. Okay. Uh, Councillor Perusa. And yes, I consider my questions important too. Just so you, before you ask the question, okay. Uh, as I think about this. So, so we now allow people to, to uh, willy-nilly park their bicycles, their pedal bicycles, um, all over the sidewalk everywhere. I mean, you know, both where you, we have designated bike, whatever you call them, the rings, um, or there's a, like a little tree, they block it against the tree, or the corner post, and nobody really like parks their bike across a sidewalk uh, obstructing pedestrians, correct? More or less. As long as the bike is not obstructing pedestrians, then it is legally parked. There, there are some stipulations around not parking on trees because of damage to trees. No, okay, but, but in most cases, you allow people providing they haven't parked their bike across the sidewalk uh, to basically leave their bicycles in, in places where they're not bugging anybody uh, along the along sidewalks and boulevards and things like that, correct? Correct. Okay, so so why are you and and you don't go out and confiscate any of those bikes? Not really, right? Unless they've been left over for like they're like derelict over the winter or something, and and then you you clean them up as part of a cleaning program, but not because they're you're collecting the bikes, right? Correct. Okay. So why wouldn't we, as part of a pilot, allow, uh, uh, allow e-scooters that look like, a lot of them look like bicycles, to be able to do the same thing as, as a bicycle? Like, on, on, on the, on, like why do we need to kind of like regulate the hell out of those? The, the regulation piece is around mass commercial um, supply of these for e-scooter sharing is what we've seen in other cities and so the city would be report, uh, reporting on a, a permitting program for those kind of, of e-scooter uses and that's we would be reporting before okay, the end of this let, year. So let, me, let me ask the question another way. Let's say we approve your recommendation today and that goes to the province and the province adopts uh, our uh, recommendation and and basically makes it illegal for anybody to, to leave their the e-bikes along uh, the, the sidewalks, or like park them like bicycles, right? 
The province wouldn't identify where e-bike, e-scooters can park. That would be up to the city. Um, the province is allowing these to be legal to, for use on roads and some stipulations around you have to be 16, right. you have to use a helmet if you're under 18. Um, that's what the province is proposing right now. Right. They're and asking for feedback on right. that. And we're saying no on, uh, on boulevards or along sidewalks and places where there might be space for you to park your e-bike, but we're going to say no just because we would allow a bicycle, a pedal bicycle to park there, but we won't allow uh, your e-bike that it's the same size as the bike but you can't park there. This issue came up that it would be legalized last week or the week prior. Um, and so as a, something that council can decide now to ensure we don't have hundreds, thousands of e-scooters proliferate the sidewalks between now and the end of the year, it allows some clarity that they, they cannot be parked on the sidewalk obstructing pedestrians. But we would come in, back in, in also in, before in, the end of the year with a permit program. In relation to, in relation to bicycles and bicycle use, um, how many people out there, uh, in percentage terms, are using e-bikes? Is it hundreds of thousands? Are you, are you talking about e-scooters that yeah, are the e subject right now? Yeah, e-scooters, yeah. Uh, we, I've seen only handfuls of people, but what happens is that a company comes in and leaves these on the sidewalk in cities in, in thousands uh, in a bulk, and they get left and they become a problem from a safety and accessibility perspective. So un until the end of the year, really literally like two months from, three months from now at the most, we would come back with a report uh, stipulating what a permit system for these programs would look like. Staff are already so, so, working on that. So why wouldn't we take that approach? If it becomes a problem and, uh, and then companies are just dropping hundreds of thousands of uh, e-bikes all over our sidewalks, that we would regulate them then? We're trying to be proactive because the province is changing the rules now, um, so we want to make sure that our city can be somewhat prepared while we get the, the permit system in place. So we're, we're, we're basically moving to deal with a problem that hasn't occurred, but we are anticipating that that problem for sure will happen. We know that this has been a problem in many other cities, and we are looking to support the province's recommendations and making these e-scooters legal. But the issue of parking them has been a problem, leaving them on the sidewalk. This protects us from problems until we have a permit system. So, I all right, um, yeah, uh, Councilor Bruzzi, you're well over five minutes, um, but those were good questions. I, I, I want to, I, I, you, please I, separate those recommendations out because I want to vote against that one, and I'd like to. Yeah, no. If you want to vote, add Siri Adam. We can arrange that. Um, Councilor Talby has promised me a very clarify. fast question. I feel like we're mixing and matching different issues here. So there's the one issue, you know, a personal use, um, but the one that's actually a little bit more of concern is when it's like a company that's renting them out and mm -hmm. you have like a pick up, drop off that's app based. Mm -hmm. You can pick it up wherever and drop it wherever. Is that more what the problem is? Yes, that's, that's the problem that we're trying to address until we have a permit system to regulate those companies. And you had mentioned that other places have had this problem. So somebody had written in to me, um, a former colleague who's at Western University, and said that they're finding them all over campus, they're tripping hazards, there's not really regulation. So is that the sort of problem that you are trying to avoid here? That's correct. Thank you. Um, speakers? Councillor Layton? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I have a motion. Yes, you do. Um, and this is to amend the, the, it looks a lot longer than, than it is, but it does two things. Uh, in recommendation one, it adds the Toronto Parking Authority to the list of city divisions to be consulted, and then it includes the language, including the possibility of adding electric scooters to the bike share fleet as a way of managing e-scooters in the public right of way. And then the second, my second uh, amendment is to recommendation two, to delete the word standing from the list so that it includes parking, storing, and leaving an e-scooter on any sidewalk. Uh, th that was just what I came up with quickly. The first one, first of all, I should go back and say, there, this, is, this is actually a very complex but a pressing issue that the city needs to deal with. All around North America, and I can anticipate in other countries as well, they're managing this issue of dockless bikes and dockless e-scooters. And, and cities are struggling. Like they, that some had instituted pilots and have one or two of these operating in their city, um, but 
they, they didn't have the opportunity of time to address this issue of where these things get stored. Um, there's also been reports that they are not all uh, an, an, uh, an, an environmental, they're, they're not all that environmental because how you recharge them and how you actually move them around the city uh, is an, a, a large producer of, uh, of greenhouse gases. So th there needs to be some, some, some careful thought. We have the opportunity of careful thought here in Toronto. It's unfortunate the province is giving us like 48 hours to review a set of uh, regulations on this, but that doesn't mean that it ends there because there's two distinct, distinct things. The province, who are talking about the personal use on the roads, and then there's the sharing that is really where the city will have most of its domain and where it should because we're regulating what happens in the public right-of-way, which is what the other cities are struggling with uh, because these vehicles, they're not, they're, they're not stationary. They move around. They can move around in the right-of-way. So even if a rider puts it in the right place, it can end up in the middle of the right-of-way or tossed on someone's lawn or in the middle of the street pretty easily. And then it's the city's problem, and it's gonna, the, the enforcement around that is going to be enormously expensive. Going up and picking these things up and then administering, the, giving them back to the companies, it's going to be expensive. So we need to do it right. My first motion is, I think we have a way of doing it right, and that's because our bike share system has docks, and they're put in places that, where, where stuff fits. They're difficult to cite, these docks, but we've managed to put a lot of them out. And if we can fuse the two technologies, we might actually have a really great way of avoiding the problem that every other municipality is now str struggling with. So I've added that in just for consideration. I'm not saying do it, I'm saying talk to the TPA. Maybe they can be a, 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 a partner here. And then the elimination of standing was if, if someone's standing next to their uh, e-scooter, that's probably okay on the sidewalk. It's when they leave it that the problem is initiated. But I want to make sure we, we make right clear as a committee. We're, we're in a time crunch here, so we haven't had a lot of time to think this through or, or consult with the public, which is problematic, because we might not be seeing what the final solution should be. So I would encourage everyone here, I would encourage the media and all other councillors not to start sharpening their, 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 their spikes on their scooters quite yet. Um, we have another opportunity to look at this to see if we, we get it right going into council, um, that we could address this issue of not opening up the sidewalks to all sharing technologies right away, uh, depending on the regulations, but, but, but address this issue of personal use because there are individuals who have these electric scooters already. It's just not clear they can actually use them anywhere. Um, so I, I just think we've got some time between now and council if we all keep an open mind listen to our constituents, listen to city staff. We may, we may land on a different point than we are at this second. Um, but I thank the chair for bring, and, and staff for bringing it forward. The province is being a little unfair in the way they're treating this. Thank you, uh, Councillor Layton. Any other speakers? Uh, I would just uh, simply say that um, I was in Denver this past uh, summer, which is a, an avid location for uh, e-scooters. And uh, I saw many of the benefits of e-scooters of getting people around in, a, in, a, in an economical uh, and environmentally friendly way. And yet I also saw uh, some of the downside where people were leaving scooters uh, tipped over, blocking the uh, sidewalk, blocking the public uh, right away. But I, I must admit, as a, as a city uh, with lots of bike paths and, and trails uh, and, and commitment to that kind of mobility. Uh, it was actually very exciting. We were actually staying near a university campus. It was very exciting to see all these people on, on, on scooters, and it created a vibrancy uh, in, in the city. It was certainly, uh, for many, the last mile uh, to either uh, destination of, of work or, or home, and, and I thought it was, uh, <laughs> it was quite neat, actually. Uh, but I have, I have no doubt that the personal injuries uh, that, I've, that I've read about on these I, I took one for a test drive, uh, and uh, they, they do go fast, and, uh, and you really have to know how to control the braking system uh, as, as well as the gas, uh, and, uh, and you also have to uh, beware of where you're leaving it, and that's going to become uh, a major issue. If these, uh, these motions are, are going to probably carry today, I once mind, 
uh, at the, I really just took uh, carriage of it from staff. Um, I think if these motions pass, we're going to regulate, hyper-regulate it right out of the city. I don't think, I don't know how these companies could ever function here. And you'll see it in small pockets, maybe, uh, maybe in private property like the distillery district, maybe on federal lands like Downshoe Park. And, and maybe have another, a, a few other locations, but I can't see any private uh, sector operating agreeing to these conditions and having it feasible in, in any way. But these are the recommendations, and maybe we can, I spoke to uh, Councillor Layton offline, and we can certainly uh, work on these as we go forward. So, um, the one motion I have is, is Councillor Layton, and then the main item. Uh, so if we can put that on the screen. All those in favor? Oh, hold, on, hold on, you were going to separate them out. Right? Uh, yes, we could uh, We could uh, uh, vote on it at Syriatum. phrase at Syriatum, right? At Syriatum, yes, yeah. it's a, okay. yes. Uh, so recommendation one, we'll take first. Uh, Councilor Peruzza, are you ready to vote? Yeah? Okay. So recommendation one is, is obviously an amendment um, to, uh, to what we had in the, um, in the original uh, motion. Uh, all those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, recommendation uh, two is, is a slight amendment to what was originally proposed, uh, deleting the word standing. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Uh, that is carried. And the item is amended. All those in favor? Opposed? Can I do that vote again? All those in favor? Okay. Opposed? That is carried. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day and the rest of the summer.